two days for a telegram to get to Rochester? You would if you didn't have any money. Welcome to the Big Honker Podcast, brought to you by Boss Shot Shells. I'm Jeff Stanfield with Andy Shaver. <laughs> yeah, and Ron. We just found, yeah. we just told Wyman that. Yeah, Dad's ashes are in there. That's amazing. They're in Boss That's Shot amazing. Shells. We have about ten cases of shotgun shells with uh-huh, him in them, uh-huh. and he's in this. Well, he'd be proud. He would be very, very proud. He was really excited about that. I don't know if he's excited about dying, but he was excited about being right. in the shotgun shells. Yeah. He went yeah. on every hunt that I had this year. I, I just put him in uh, my bag and. Wow. He was there every That's time. That's cool. That's cool. And, and, then, and then his friends, they'd come out, and then they'd want to shoot him. So, yeah. Everybody, everybody, <laughs> you know, they got to shoot Ron off. One of Dad's buddies was here, and he, he started crying. I gave him some shells. Yeah. Really? Yeah, and I was like, God dang, I just – I was happy Dad passed away because he was miserable. Sure. But sure. for them, they didn't – I mean, and I called a couple of them when he died. I called him. I was like, hey, I just want to let you know Dad passed away. And we'll, a couple of them, we got really, <clears throat> really yeah. just – really emotional about it yeah. I'm like, well there comes a time whenever it's you know when they get suffering so badly like my father did it was like it was a relief yes it is yeah. big relief because it was it was really really terrible yeah they don't the pain they were going through and the people that don't see it every day they don't they don't always realize that right they think anyway for everybody that's listening wyman menzer the most interesting man in texas <laughs> maybe in america is with us today <laughs> thank you we were talking about before we went on, Andy was talking about his grandfather. Would have been my gr- great grandfather. And his and his brother took a trip. They had to go to California for some reason, and they they were on the way. And so my great grandfather's brother, which would be my great uncle, I guess, had a gambling problem. <laughs> they blew all. He blew all of their travel money in Reno, Nevada, and no cell phones back then. Can't yeah. call. And he sent a telegram home to rochester texas and said hey i'm out of money we're out of money please help <laughs> so his da- their daddy sent them a hundred dollars or however much money. that's a lot of money and, and it might not have been a hundred dollars it was just it was money to get them home and he sent them the money and two words come home come he was tired of them <laughs> jacking around on the road and he couldn't remember what they had to go to california for but and i it, couldn't imagine you're out of money you're in reno nevada you got to wait for the the wire to get there uh-huh. and then get back. Yeah. I don't know how many I don't know how many wow. days. Wow. I, I I don't know exactly how the telegram. I mean, I know how the telegram worked. Uh-huh. So if you send a telegram to someone, it would go from Reno to Vegas to somewhere else to somewhere else. They pass it on down the road. Isn't that correct? I'm I'm assuming. Uh-huh. And it's all the way to Rochester, and then to come back to you. And I'm sure they had Western Union, so mm-hmm. you got a hundred dollars. They just wired. Right. I I, I bet. It took longer for the telegraph to get there than it did to get the money. <laughs> Probably so. I've only been in Nevada once, and uh, I was in, um, it was when I was at Texas Tech, and we had gone to Boise, Idaho to the, um, yeah, it was, yeah, it was Boise to the uh, international meeting for the Society of Ranch Management. I was on the plant team. And so we rolled in there one night at some little town just in the edge of Nevada, I still recall, uh, telling our coach, hey, we're going to go over to this this place over here and get us a beer. Elko, Nevada, I bet. I, I, it was a small place. So I don't know how large Elko is, but it was a very small. But it had a gambling joint, and we didn't know it. We went into the whorehouse. <laughs> and uh, and so we all walked in because we were all broke. Yeah. You know, college God. kids, we were all broke. <laughs> and all, we started seeing all these gals sitting around, you know, and then they would – when we, as we sat down, of course, they went one sidle up to us. And finally, I think we well, we bought one beer each. And finally, the old madame, she came up and she said, if you boys are not going to get in some business here, you need to leave. So we finished our beers and got out and walked out. <laughs> <laughs> we hated to leave, but we, we were broke. <laughs> I, I, my senior year in high school, our, some kids went to school were weld. They were doing wel- welding. They had a class, and they learned how to weld. Uh-huh. They, it, it, a great class, because matter of fact, a couple of them do it for a living still. Uh-huh. Anyways, they went to San Antonio to a state meet, 
and they snuck out of their hotel room nine or ten o'clock at night and they went to a titty bar uh-huh. underage one of them had a fake ID the other ones didn't they went in and got it and this old stripper girl starts sitting by this kid and he had 20 or 30 dollars on him uh-huh. which in 1986 20 or 30 dollars pretty good little chunk of change sure. she starts sitting in his lap she goes like well buy me some sh- a glass of champagne okay I'll buy you some champagne well she bought a glass of champagne that cost a hundred dollars a glass oh or some my shit. goodness so anyways they get ready to leave you know and leave and they're all happy and shit and that bouncer comes up it says here's your check they were like two hundred and forty dollars. Oh, for like, uh, and They pulled their money together. They had thirty eight dollars or something <laughs> between them. So they had to. The bouncer made the guy stay there. The other ones had to go back and get their teacher after they snuck out and went to a titty bar, mm. and they had to come oh. back down there. And they, the teachers had to give a come up with some cash so the kids could get out of yeah. there. Oh my god! They had lots of hell to pay when they got back to Pistol Falls. <laughs> oh, what man. would they have done to them if they had they not got the money? You think they beat the piss out of them, or are those days over with? I mean, what are you going to – you're going to beat the hell out of a 17-year-old kid? You're right. You know? It depends right. what kind of place you – I'm from, – from the from the story and the description I got, they yeah. were not at a high-classy <clears throat> titty bar, so they mm-hmm. might have got their damn thumbs broke. I yeah. don't I don't yeah. know. Yeah. yeah. You know? Back then, we didn't live in a woke world where everybody felt sorry for your ass. It was a t- – well, you know, because, like, if you'd have told that to some grown men, they'd be like, ha, 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 yeah, when I was, like, you know, like Wyman. I mean, yeah. uh, it was a different world nowadays, and absolutely. kids weren't coddled and shit. No. No. So, you know, if they'd got their ass beat, their dads, when they come home, well, you dumb bastard, you should have yeah. went to a strip bar. <laughs> now you get to work it off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, nowadays, you just, it'd be just, I don't know, this whole world we live in. We're going to talk about the Nebraska thing. Me and Wyman okay. talked about this in the office a minute ago. Nebraska. Blake, yes, Blake told me this yesterday. The state of Nebraska is paying $500,000 to every high school or community in Nebraska that has an Indian mascot or symbol to remove it. Off their gym floors and everything, and to change their names. Paying them how much? $500,000. Half a million dollars. That's just absolutely preposterous. I, I just don't understand who's pushing all this stuff. And and, and that it's being allowed. You know, what, yes. where where are the the uh, the politicians, the board members that are saying, no, this is not going to happen? I don't understand. If I was in the in a position to say no, I guarantee I'd set up a, a screaming fit. Oh, I would, too. The problem that they deal with is it's it's – Probably Nebraska is probably just like Texas. Mm-hmm. Everything goes through freaking Austin. Yeah. So Austin says the same thing, and they say, tell you what we're going to do. We're going to cut off our state funding to you if you don't do this. Yep. And that's yep. how they do the yeah. shit. Yeah. But it's because the people that are in Austin or mm-hmm. in Lincoln. Mm-hmm. What is, is Lincoln the capital of Nebraska? Or something? I don't know. I think, yeah. it's, I think it is Omaha. They don't have no balls. Yeah. Just that's another right. liberal bastion that's, of nutless people. That's the problem. They just don't have a backbone. But I don't understand if your name was he, – he was telling Lincoln. me o- Ogallala – Indians. That's the name of it. Well, Ogallala is an Indian name. The town's named well, after Yeah, Ogallala Sioux. Yeah. 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 But the, the, their name of their team is called the, the Indians. Golly. Well, what, how is, I don't I, understand. They're taking the name the Indians. No, they're getting rid of it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, they're going to have to be the Ogallala Otters or some shit, I guess. <sighs> but I, I don't understand where. I don't understand why Indian why Indian's a bad name. I don't either. You know, but, uh, you know, they're, I think, you know, they, they would rather be called Native Americans. They don't want to be called Indians. That's, that's, that's the drift I get. Of course, I don't pay that much attention to it. I just hear about it sometimes, you know, through various sources. But it's, uh, you know, they like to be called Native American. And, and, you know, when you're talking about paleontological findings or archaeological findings, it's Native American. Mm-hmm. It's not, you know, we found some Indian, you know, Dead Indians, you know, kind of a deal. It's you know, we found some Native American. So if they call, sites. if they name their team the Native Americans, would that be okay, or would I, that still I, be considered yes. racist? I, they'd probably find some reason to say or it was the, racist. Or the Ogallala Sioux, you could call them. Could you call right. them the Sioux? That's, that's the a, yeah. Sioux? That'd be. I mean, what'd be wrong with Ogallala Sioux? Because that is the Ogallala. That's right. one of the. That's one, one of the, the, the sub tribe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Ogallala. The, the the Seminoles, the Florida State Seminoles. Mm-hmm. They didn't change their name. Okay. They said they're not going to. Probably yeah. because Good. it's. Well, they just Correct. said they the yeah. Utah's the Utes. So yeah. in South yeah. Dakota, I think their sports franchise is the Fight and Sues. Yeah. I just don't. Indians <laughs> are a a mystery in a lot of ways. They they were a, it, they're a romantic story. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. here's some guys that, especially the Indians that I grew up with. I can't say Native Americans because I just forget because I grew up mm-hmm. calling them Indians, pilgrims mm-hmm. and Indians. But the Indians <clears throat> I grew up with hunted and fished. They they lived off the land. Mm-hmm. Man, when I cl- when I grow up, I want to be an Indian. What a cool job, yeah, you know? Right, what a cool right. thing to be. Yeah. And then you 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 read more and you study on them, and they obviously got the shaft by the white man on a lot of situations. Oh my goodness, yes. But 
You're telling me that if the Sioux hadn't invented a gun, would they not the whole country be Sioux Indians? Uh, they, <clears throat> if they would have had the uh, the weaponry that we had, it would have lasted a lot longer. Yeah. The, the war. But but one Indian tribe that come up with that machinery mm-hmm. would have ran controlled the other Indian tribes. Oh yeah, sure, sure I mean, certainly. I mean, th- they were uh, the the various tribes. Uh, except for your um, your more sedentary, they were warring tribes. Yes, your uh, your mobile, you know, your tribes that moved from A to B. You know, whenever their campsites became so ripe that they couldn't live anymore, they or the game went. Well, th- those were generally they were warring tribes. They mm-hmm. they grew up from ch- childhood as fighters, and so yeah, that is whoever the strongest one. Now, but. We always leave that out of the history books. Yep. We yep. act like they were just some peaceful. Like yep. Oklahoma was the Cherokees. Uh-huh. The Apaches were in Texas. New Mexico had a Comanches or whatever it was. Uh-huh. And they just stayed there and they didn't bother each other. And that's not the uh, truth. That's, that's baloney. Yeah. They raped, fought, pillaged yeah. each other all the time. But well, they didn't get their feelings hurt because that's the way it was. Well, you know, the Comanche and the Kiowa, they, they, uh, they basically united to fight uh, Anglo right. infringement upon their land. And they, I think, I think I was told that there's some uh, rock art in the Panhandle uh, of Oklahoma along the Cimarron that details that treaty between the two, Kiowa and the Comanche. Uh, I heard that a few years ago. That's very interesting. Mm-hmm. What What was the chief's name in Indiana? The Tippecanoe and Tyler too. What mm. was the Indian that they fought that? I can't remember the I name don't. of the Indian, but that Indian was one of the great warriors from the maybe the Illinois or the Seneca Indian tribe. Iroquois. The no, Iroquois? It, wasn't, it wasn't Iroquois. Oh, those are New York. Yeah, it's the uh, <coughs> because they're the ones. Tip canoe. Yeah, tip a canoe and Tyler too. It was a president ran for that was his mm-hmm. slogan. He was a general, mm-hmm. and he he won at tip a canoe. Mm-hmm. Anyways, the Indian chief there. He pulled all them tribes together, the Ohio, the Ohio Indians is mm-hmm, what that was, mm-hmm. and because they went into Kentucky and fought. And I cannot think of the day. Oh, Chief's I read name. about that not long ago <clears throat> about that uh, that that he united those tribes. I think I saw it on maybe a TV special, but I don't recall the name. A very strong, strong leader. Yeah, and there's maybe even a. No, wait a minute. I'm thinking about Shenandoah. Shenandoah was a chief, and and he united a bunch of a bunch of the. Uh, the tribes and to 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 fight. It wasn't did a good, crazy good horse stayed in the Dakotas, didn't he? Uh, let's see. Crazy horse. Uh, crazy horse was killed in Nebraska at Fort. I went there. I saw the spot that that, that he was stabbed. Mm, but he stayed been, in the Midwest. Um. Yes. He never came south. He never came into Texas, Oklahoma. He was a he was a more plains. Tecumseh. 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 I'm thinking about. Okay, Tecumseh. You know, there's a. uh, They established a. Now he was a Comanche. Tecumseh was a Comanche. Did did he fight in Ohio then? I'm not aware of that, but there's a an old um, uh, reservation site over by Throckmorton, and uh, and that's and they were going to put Tecumseh there. Trying to think, settle him there, and they and the the locals ran ran him off. Basically, told him, "We're going to kill you if you don't leave." So he had to go to Oklahoma. It says Tecumseh's Confederacy was a confederation of Native Americans in the Great Lake region of the United States that began to form in the early 19th century, around a teaching of maybe that. Okay, there's Tecus. What the, is the, the name prophet. of that Comanche? The confederation uh, grew over several years and came to include several thousand warriors. So it is Tecumseh I was talking about. Okay, the Shawnee again. leader Tecumseh, the brother of the prophet, developed into the leader of the group as early as 18. I have been to that site <coughs> in Throckmorton where that where that old reservation is, and it was a it was a Comanche, and that sounds like his name, but it's been years ago. Well, anyway, that <coughs> Tecumseh. They, they they have all kinds of things named after him also. Mm-hmm. They got Tecumseh okay. Indians. They got all, I mean, mm-hmm. a motors or all kinds of stuff. For okay. I just don't understand why it's I, it's still Nebraska. It's mm-hmm. just like all the other stuff. You know, Midwestern sure. changed their names from the Indians to the Mustangs. Yeah, I don't understand why Indian is a bad deal. I just don't get. It. I don't. What, what what's a mogul? Either. What is a mogul? I've pirate. wondered that myself. Huh? It's a pirate, isn't it? I don't know. But Monday, a little town bias. They're, yeah. they're called the moguls. Yeah. Well, 
who's to say that someone that w- that's not a mogul is not offended by their football team being named after them? There you go. I don't know. I just I'm trying to find. We are living in a world that it's turned upside down. It just uh, every day I'm every day I'm more appalled. Yeah, it's hard to believe, isn't it? it? It's hard to believe, and I and I just I don't even watch want to watch the news because it's all bad. There's nothing good. And uh, depresses me, so I just sit and watch World War Two but documentaries. And whenever we had heroes, I watch a lot of World War Two. I mean, that's uh, by far the greatest generation ever. Oh my goodness, those boys were tough son of guns. Come out of the out of the depression, uh, suffering, and came in, and and they were they were. I mean, can you imagine those boys in the depression? My, like my daddy was born in 1918. I mean, he knew wagon and team. He told me about about working for the for the old mash stove, which is now the spike box, and that old that old foreman sent him over to Bitter Creek, Honey and Bitter. Uh, up on the Ross? Up, well, near it's going to be east, uh, northeast of the Ross, and um, in a wagon and team in a snowstorm. Whew. And he said, I got so cold. Now, that's cold, going from the spike box headquarters over to Honey and Bitter Creek. That's a long way on a wagon. He said, I got so cold, I thought I was going to freeze to death. And he said, I stopped at an old camp, an old house there in Honey Creek and built a fire in a rat nest on the porch. He said, I didn't care if it burned the house down <laughs> until I warmed up. And he said, I turned that wagon around and I went back to the Eggum headquarters. Tough, tough. Was people. your dad in World War II? He, uh, he was, yeah, well, he was old enough. He was 20, what, well, 1918 to 23. 23. He was married, and he worked in a B-24 factory in San Diego. Is what he did. Yeah. Both of my grandparents were at Pearl Harbor. I don't remember my either one of them really talking much about the mm-hmm. war. I've got a We've got a trunk that my grandpa gave us when he passed away, and it had part of an old Jap Zero they shot down off his boat. Really? Had just a big chunk of metal from it. Wow. And, and got a rifle, and I had the flag. He was on the uh, USS Kofel or Sufel, I don't know how they say I think it's Kofel, C-O-U-F-E-L, uh-huh. and they gave my grandfather the flag when they decommissioned the ship after it was over. Wow. He was thought that so much by his people on the wow. ship with him that he yeah. got, he had, and the flag's in my safe in there. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> th- those men, Michelle's grandpa Bob was at Normandy, <clears throat> and he was at the Battle of the Bulge and all mm-hmm. that stuff, and he was from rural Texas, mm-hmm. and he him... He was in a tavern somewhere over there in France or somewhere and ran into his brother. Really? Wow. And um, Cook, wow. Andy's grandpa, told me a story about, what's the old boy's name that used to be that, graduated from Tech, Mr. Texas Tech that was from here, the, had Andy all the what? junk and stuff over by O'Brien School. What's that guy's name? <laughs> oh, Qualls. Wayne Qualls. Oh, why do you? Call him Mr. Texas Tech. Yeah. I says, Jeez, he's, he's that all was about slapping the face about the tech. He's well, y'all are both tech graduates, but he was Mr. Texas Tech. He graduated from Tech. I know he did. I don't know. Uh, anyways, he uh, he, his his dad and Cook's dad or Cook's grandpa or somebody kin to Cook were in World War II together, and they ran into each other. No, it was it was Herman Hearn. Was it? It was Herman Hearn uh-huh. and um, ran into uh, Qualls's dad uh-huh. at a somewhere in germany or somewhere some guy said there's another uh-huh. guy from west texas downstairs he goes oh really so he's gonna go down and talk to him he knew him wow. a guy from rochester and a guy from yeah. o'brien wow, so wow. Where, but man what a t- th- those guys lived well there were two guys in benjamin uh tick morehouse and uh, of course my uncle buck he was in a tank unit uncle buck and then tick was driving a uh, supply truck and someone uh, and, and buck heard uh the uh some guy on the Radio holler out, Morehouse, get your truck in line. And he jumped out and took him a box of candy or something. <laughs> Ain't that crazy? Though? Yeah. It's just a small world in yeah. a, a big world. But those guys lived under, like a tank deal. Could you imagine having to fight the German tanks in an American Oh, tank? no. My goodness. Those Shermans against those Panzers? My it, goodness. It wasn't gracious. even close. No. No. If Germany, if God did not intervene somewhere around the long way, we would all be speaking German. Oh, sure. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. It's just. It was just, there were just so many points that where it could have gone the other direction in, in a matter of, of months, it could have gone another direction. If he would have, if Hitler would have switched from ME 109s to 262s, and they developed 262 early, but he thought a prop driven plane was the way to go. If he would have kept those 262s, it would have been a horrible, horrible disaster. 
in yes, America. It would have been because we, we didn't have nothing even close. No. The winter over there, didn't that that also help the Americans to some extent, didn't it? They couldn't the Germans couldn't advance it slowed the advance Well that happened in, in Russia. In Russia. In Russia when the, when they when they went across in uh, and started toward uh, Stalingrad, the Russian winter cut them down. Yes. Because they were fixed to take over Russia. Yeah. Yeah. Real, yeah. Real, real, real quick. And that was so crazy. You know, I, I, I may have mentioned it one time in another podcast, but I knew a, a, a German fellow that, uh, that flew in the Luftwaffe. And uh, he told me, and he was, you know, he was your typical, you know, blonde, blue eyed, very stoic. And he was a pilot. Uh, flew uh, twins and flew uh, politicians around. And, uh, and I said, well, what do you think about World War II? And he said, Hitler was a very smart man. He said he just got too spread out on too many fronts. Trying to win too many battles. And that's all he said. <clears throat> but he did say, I said, what uh, planes could you fly? And he said, I could fly any of them. He wow. was very self-assured. Yeah. He had lots of <laughs> self-confidence. <laughs> they were proud people. They were. I mean, we a lot of our engineering yeah. comes from that. The and I met another one one day. I was at a, I believe, a cattle raiser uh, convention. I had a booth. This was way back in the early '80s. And I noticed an electrician. They sent there to my booth, and he was a very, you know, business-like, uh, stout, you know, just and, and had a German brogue to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started talking to him, and I said, uh, "Where are you from?" And he told me he's in, from Germany. And I said, "Were you in World War II?" And he said, "Yes." He said, I was a paratrooper. And I went, you were tough. Because <laughs> those German paratroopers were tough cookies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you imagine blending into America after all that was mm. over? And, and there's a ton of people that were here that <clears throat> fought for Germany that lived in the He United was States. probably sent to a POW camp in Texas. Yes. And just stayed. There's a special on Netflix about, I think it, it's a, I can't remember the title of it, but it's a concentration camp guard. And he came over he got out of germany in time came over here started working at a detroit auto factory plant mm -hmm. blended right in and uh i guess somehow they found out who he was mm -hmm. and they took him back over and they tried him for war crimes see and, and i don't I, I don't understand that because if he did not do what he was told yeah. they would have killed him yeah i mean yeah. i don't I, I mean it's still i remember reading about that but yeah. <clears throat> i remember that i used to i care. used to back in the in the 80s and stuff i would collect um, all of these newspaper clippings about war criminals that had been caught mm -hmm. and, and shipped back uh, for trial. I kept all that stuff. I don't, don't know where it is today, but I kept... America's biggest enemy was one, George Soros. Yeah, that's true. You know, and he'll... They, they, I wish they'd try his ass and take him I back. I do, too. Why don't, why don't you agree with that, Jeff? I, I don't... If... if Example, Payne's fighting for our country right now. Sure. And he's not having to do anything. But let's mm -hmm. say he had to do something that he's commanded to do, and he did it. Mm -hmm. And then 50 years later or 40 years later, they come back and say, hey, what you did was against the crimes of humanity, mm -hmm. even though he was that, that guy was doing his job. Now, the people <coughs> giving the deals, you know, all the head I, SS guys, all the mm -hmm. guys, I got no problem with that. Yeah. But some guy that was working at a concentration camp, if he didn't do his yeah, job, but, they would have killed him. Yeah, but he true. had his, I think his nickname was like, the, I'm trying to find it right well, now. Uh, the Devil Next Door is what it was called. But, I mean, he was he was the guy that would pull the lever. I mean, he was the one that men, women, and children would go into these little boxes, and then he was the one that would gas them. But what yeah. if he wouldn't have done his job, what would have happened to him? That's what he was, know. his country, he was He was serving his country. I don't agree with what he did, but yeah. I'm just saying, if he would have said, I'm not doing that, something, what do you think they're going to do to him? They're going to yeah. kill him. Maybe that could have been the catalyst. Yeah. Maybe he could okay. have roused, roused the troops all up right. and, and all of them okay. taking okay. the day off. I'm going to give you another example. Jimmy yeah. Doolittle. Mm -hmm. What if Jimmy Doolittle, the, the Japanese come back over and they take over, they wanted to make Jimmy Doolittle go to... He dropped one of the bombs, didn't mm -hmm. he? No, 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 no. He 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 led the B twenty four, B twenty. He just B, raided B Tokyo. B twenty five. He raided Tokyo. Okay, B twenty fives. Who who's the ones that dropped the bomb on the Nola Gay? Oh, I can't recall his name. He he died. I think he lived in Lubbock before he passed away. Okay. Let, let's just yeah. use him as an example. Uh -huh. He flew the Nola Gay. Mm -hmm. He drops the little little man or whatever they one yeah, of the fat H bombs, man, fat, yeah. one of the bombs, mm -hmm. and blows up them people. Thirty years later. The Japanese want to take him for war crimes. Mm -hmm. Does he deserve that? But I think that wasn't there was a there was a council mm, that a got a, there's a council that got a hold of all this and they decided what was a war crime. I, yeah. Is that at the end of the war? Isn't that 
I, I, I know history, they, they right? did. They did. Right. And they yep. said that this, yep. if we find somebody, you're going to be. Oh, I'm not arguing that they didn't do that to him. I'm just saying I don't think that the guy, those people were, if they didn't do that, they were going to be killed. Hitler didn't jack around with people. If you didn't do your job, the Gestapo or somebody was going to have yeah. your ass. You were for your country. That was what yeah. it was. And the same with the Americans. So, are, Andy, the guy who dropped the atomic bomb, is he guilty of the same thing? <clears throat> what was the, what was the Enola Gay was the, the, the no. plane. If you drop the atomic bomb, are you guilty? Did that council? Did, what 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 am I trying to think? What is the word that I'm trying to think of? The Geneva the, Convention. The Geneva Convention. Mm -hmm. Did they have they deemed that the dropping of the atomic bomb is punishable? They didn't know there was a, a such crime? thing as an atomic bomb at the yeah. time. I'm just saying those guys that did that stuff were under command to do that. The direct they orders. Were. It wasn't. He, he didn't wake up the morning and thought, you know, I want to go kill a bunch of people. I don't think. That's that's what I'm saying. Whoever was the commander that decided that, I got like Hitler. He should have died at war crimes. I, I'd got no, oh, no, no problem yeah. with that. But his soldiers were doing their jobs. If mm. they didn't, have you not watched you Hogan's know, you just, Heroes? You just <laughs> want, you just wonder. You know what what was that point they had to cross? What was yes. that line they had to cross from being following orders to war crimes? Yes. and that's right. that's the point. That's that that line of demarcation that that I don't really understand. I guess that wanton killing, the yes. wanton actual going, you know, uh, you know, this guy stops and picks something up and I shoot him in the head. That's war crime. Yes. But yeah. if you're ordered to go in and put these people and, you know, and, and kill them and close the door, you're following orders. I don't know. Yeah. Here's that's, what that's this guy did. One. Ivan the Terrible used to cut Ivan the, the Terrible. Yeah, that's Ivan it. the Terrible used to cut the ears off the workers as they walked that by. That's wrong. That's wrong. I got people. no problem with that. And deal. these people were forced to continue working as they bled. Shortly after he would proceed to the killing, he would proceed to killing them outright. He tortured victims with pipes, swords, and whips before they entered the gas chambers. Well, then yeah, I so he was, war crimes. Okay, yeah, so okay. he was a special kind. He okay. wasn't just telling them, he okay, was a this sadist. is not. Yes. But I don't want, he was a sadist. you know, Johan, who flips a switch over there because he's told to do that for the right. same thing because they're not they weren't all bad people they were fighting yeah. for their country yeah. just like what's going on in russia and they were Ukraine a patriot right now. There are, their country their people are serving their country that's right um i don't i mean we had a lot of american soldiers in germany and france and all of europe and stuff that stole a lot of things i mean they mm -hmm. said the biggest the art thieves and uh artifact thieves in the country were the u.s soldiers oh really i did not know that. they stole a ton of stuff yeah you know i mean all I mean, anything I don't you neither can imagine. My, none of my uncles stole anything. They, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they brought even these souvenirs home with them. I've got uh, your neighbor, and I'm not going to say their name because they have a couple of Rugers that oh, come from Germany. And I'll tell you, a couple of Lugers? Lugers. Lugers, not yeah. no, Ruger. Yeah. It's a Luger. No, Luger. Luger. It's a Luger. Luger, Luger 9 millimeter. Yeah. Okay, they have a couple of Lugers then. Uh huh. And um, so there's people that brung back stuff, but yeah. they said there was lots of art and gold. There's a movie with John Goodman, and it's a movie, but it's about a, a, the U.S. Army had a regiment that all they did was go to preserve art. I saw that. It's a, very, that. It's a very good show. Yeah, I saw really that. really good show, yeah. and it talks about a lot of that. I don't know how true a lot of it is, but I, yeah. it was based on true facts. Yeah. I, I, have, a, uh, I have a Nazi flag that uh, I made a trade for back in 1978. A uh, guy come by, well, Tick Morehouse came by, and uh, he, of course, he was over in Germany, and whenever the war was over, well, they they just walked around Nuremberg, he and some buddies, and uh, and he had a, one of those big, like, eight feet tall, four, uh, five feet, uh, you know, eight by five, you know, feet flags uh, with big swastikas, and uh, he wanted a picture that I had, and so I traded him that picture of a wild <laughs> turkey for that flag. I still have it today. Boy, the liberals would have your ass in that. You'd be a you'd be a oh. Nazi sympathizer for that. <laughs> yeah. But that's history. But that's history. Hey, it's history. Yes. You know? It still has a, it still has a clamp, the metal clamp on it where wow. it hung from the flag from the pole. flagpole. That's awesome. What <clears throat> Americans looted? This is just in one case. American soldiers looted twenty five million pounds in Nazi gold from a secret treasure trove hidden by SS overlord Heinrich Heimler in the closing days of World War II. The gold, money, silver weighed 150 pounds were hidden in a post office that doubled as a clandestine vault in a There's small a movie about that German too. town wow. of the movies with uh, the crazy guy Sutherland and Don Rickles and all uh -huh. them one of the movies is about that with uh, the Dirty Dozen or one of those movies off mm -hmm. of that and I can't remember mm -hmm. the one but it, that's one of those movies what's it? Clint Eastwood's in it I, Charles yeah. Bronson I don't I don't watch those I just watch, watch documentaries that's that that movie's about that right there about they go to yeah. that little town to steal that gold and wow. they use all American uh, 
troops yeah. and stuff. But it was pretty common. They, well, Heinrich Himmler needed his daggum gold stolen. Yeah. <laughs> if there's anybody out there that needed it. But they, but they got a lot of him. they did a lot of that stuff. That was pretty common. Yeah. yeah. That, that's that's pretty interesting. I w- I wish they would have never ever tore down Adolf Hitler's home in the mountains. They they should have. I mean, there was so much hate at that time, and yeah. and there was so much evil, and there was so much so much. Uh, um, hard feelings against Germans and the Nazis that that they did some things. I wish they also. I wish they would have preserved that. Well, At least something. I wish I could think of the name of that now. It's got a. Uh, oh goodness gracious! You know there was the Eagle's Nest. Uh, uh, man, oh the the Ober, was it? I can't the, think of the name the, of it. Uh, it's like Ober something. Yes. I can't speak German. What's what's, what's the. Um, Adolf Hitler's secret mountain resort. It's called the Eagle's Nest. Hitler's Eagle's Nest in Germany. No, there's another name. Yeah, there's another, there's name. another name. Yeah. There's another name. There's another name for it. Yes, and uh, I think there's another place. I think there, Eagle's he Nest is one. It's Old Zollenberg is what I'm seeing. No, the hill above. I don't speak. This German is the either. place they tried to put the uh, Val- Valkyrie or whatever they say that Valkyrie. on Valkyrie. Where, where they were going to kill him yeah. at, uh-huh. and I can't remember the name of it. I'm going to say Bucharest, but that's not it. But it's a weird name yeah. that's got something like that. But it was a. It was his resort in the mountains, his secret cabin. Yeah, yeah. Where, uh, what was the lady's name he was with? Uh, oh, Hitler and... Uh, Ava Braun. Ava Braun. Ava Braun, yes. Yep. Ava Braun. And they would go to that. That was their their place they would go to. Now, did everybody shoot? Because Hitler and her, they speculations are they shot themselves. But didn't a lot of other people, didn't they just poison themselves? Well, uh, Hitler took a poison pill and then he shot himself. Oh, he did? And I don't remember if, um, and I think Ava Braun, she took a poison pill. I don't know if she was shot, but uh, but the uh, oh, what's the the um, propaganda chief? Um, Berghoff, is that it? That sound Berghoff. Right? Berghoff. Yes. Yep. Yes. 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 The, what was the pro- propaganda chief for Hitler? Um, <clears throat> um, let me see. Oh goodness, he poisoned all of his children. Gave him first a sedative. Oh, Goebbels? Uh, Joseph, Joseph Goebbels. Goebbels. Goebbels, yeah, Joseph Goebbels. He po- uh, gave all of his children, like five of them, uh, uh, some sort of a sleeping aid, and then he put uh, uh, cyanide in their mouth. And, and Golly. Them. Now, big conspiracy, the first big conspiracy theory, or probably when the first is, is that he's in Argentina, and he died in Argentina nah, as an old man. Nah, yeah. he, oh, I, I don't think so either. No. But that's no, a no. big deal. Joseph but the, Goebbels, no. But they said you can go to... Argentina, yeah, and you can find some German towns down there. That oh are, yeah, that's well, that's a that's a big deal. Yes, yeah, it looks just deal. like you're in Germany, and you and you don't go asking about about people uh, like, for instance, whenever the Jews were out in in doing their Nazi hunting, mm-hmm. uh, they had to watch you; they'd be killed in Argentina. They 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 would, really? they would actually kill the Jews. There's if they sh- knew you were hunting a war criminal. Yeah, they'd go after you. Have you really? wa- have you yeah. seen that show Nazi Hunter? Oh yeah, that's pretty interesting. You bet. I watched all of that stuff, that, that original stuff. That is yeah. really interesting how all that went down. Yeah, it's a Tarantino movie, but I liked Inglorious Bastards. It's kind of the same thing. I didn't they, see that. They uh, they round up all the SS guys, and um, it's a good movie. It's called Inglor. It's got Brad Pitt in it, but um, mm-hmm. I'm sure he took a lot of liberties. But well, I know he did because at the end they kill Hitler in a theater. But yeah. <laughs> well, way yeah. to go, Andy! You ruined the movie. Yeah, we've it's, ruined, a, it's entertaining though. Know, but he, you're not gonna watch it. We've now. ruined yeah. 007 <laughs> yeah. for everybody, and now this. Last week we ruined 007. You only got killed in the last movie. Oh, I didn't know that. Absolute trash. He's yes. gonna be a black woman now. <laughs> yeah. Oh really? 007. Seriously. Piss Jeff right on. That makes me mad in hell. <laughs> it's a classic. We don't even mess with a classic. Why would you kill off James Bond? He's been there since 1962. Yeah. A, a white crazy. chick magnet. Yeah. Sex. Um, you know, whatever you want to call them, sexist males. Yeah, showing us pig. Show, we need more of that in the world. Yeah, so we now do. we're gonna make him a black woman. Uh, you know, why right. can't they just make a 003 with her? I don't care. Double <laughs> oh one, give her number one. But yeah. you know, nobody wants to see a, a woman super. There's no such thing. Have no. you ever met a woman in your life who's worried about her whipping your ass? Ever? They're whooping mine. Yeah. A woman physically mm. beating your ass. Oh, I've seen a few that probably could. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you never, you've never, have you ever had a guy that intimidated though? That you thought, that's a bitch whooped my ass. Oh, hell yeah. That's yes, right. But not a woman. Uh, probably not. No, that's what, so a woman super cop or something that's going to beat mm-hmm. you up? Nobody mm-hmm. worries about that no, no, shit. No, 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 no. That's, it's, it's more that woke shit. Yeah, I've never come in, went in the yeah. building and a woman come in and thought, oh, fuck, I'm going to hope she don't look me <laughs> I hope she's in a good yeah. mood today. I mean, there's been some places, <laughs> I've been around, ass. there's been some guys I know and I'm like, oh, fuck, here yeah. he is, you know? I had a roommate one time at Tech. I, 
<laughs> he played football, and uh, yeah, he could have he could have done a quick job on me. Yeah, but but, <laughs> but a woman never. And I pissed him off too. <laughs> <laughs> he felt sorry for me. <laughs> I just wonder if Hitler would have got a hold of the atomic bomb. Oh, he, he would have used, oh, it. Would have used in it in a heartbeat. He First play would have been London. He would have blown London out, and then he would have tried his best to get a rocket to get across the Atlantic yeah. to, yeah. to New York. The United States is blessed that we're away from all of that. Oh, mess. absolutely. It's the best thing absolutely. ever happened to us. we got the, the most disorganized country in the world south of us. Mm -hmm. The country to the north of us, I know so many great Canadians, but that pussy they got for oh, a leader. he is a loser. Oh, he I'm is telling a pussy. you. Is, is being, and, and we got a dumbass for president now because he's got dementia. Absolutely. But I would say Trudeau is the white version of Barack Obama. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Nutless is I be. agree. I agree. And Biden is just Obama incarnate because Obama, he's still pulling all the punches he's, right now. He's pulling them. He's too quiet. Like we was talking about a while ago, he's, when, he's not, when he's quiet, he's doing something. Yes. Yeah. He's getting things done his way. Otherwise, he'd be out making these little speeches and you know trying to be Mister Important. See, he could you couldn't do the shit Biden's doing if you're competent. No right, way, right? Because no. you'd have to answer questions and right, people would be right, on you. Right. Biden has no clue that people think he's a dumbass. I, I think you're right. He he doesn't. He don't know what's going on mm -hmm. right now. I'm not. I cannot stand Joe Biden. I cannot stand him at all. He's a just a typical Washington D.C. bureaucrat, just uh -huh. like Mac Thornberry and everybody else has been up there for a long time. And I think they're all the same. But. The Joe Biden from 1970 to 1985 is not the Joe Biden that we have now. No, no, no. I mean, he was outspoken, it, it, and he was so vain that he would want yeah. to get up there and talk and ask questions right. and tell you stuff. This guy today don't even yeah. know he's answering well, questions. Well, and what's also so sad is, is he thinks he's tough. Oh, yeah. yeah. He, yeah. he thinks he's a badass. Mm -hmm. You know, like Corn Pop. <laughs> the Corn Pop story. Yeah. I'm just going, oh, man. Give me a break. Did you watch any of the State of the Union address? No. no. Nope. Oh, God, no. I ain't wasting my time. No. It's no, no. And what they, what they did that they didn't do with Trump is they integrated Dem Republicans and Democrats. So when Trump was in office, Republicans had the right, Democrats had the left. Yes. No, not this time. Why? They, they, so that it would look like everybody was standing up when they oh, would applaud on TV. Oh, yeah. And another reason why is because most of them Republican bastards up there are sellouts. Well, I believe that. Mitt Romney? I be oh, good gracious, But that, yes. the, the, Lindsey Graham, every one of them's that way. Lindsey Graham's that way. McConnell. The, how yeah. many of them guys ever whoop somebody's ass? And honestly, <laughs> we, have, we have the one congressman that I probably wouldn't want to fight, Ronnie Jackson. He was on a SEAL mm -hmm. team. He was a doctor, but yeah. he was still on a SEAL team. Yeah. Yeah. Ronnie's a good stand-up dude. Mm -hmm. And he's the only one that speaks out against any of this shit yeah. just about. Ted Cruz mm -hmm. actually seems like he's got some balls on him, too. Yeah. But most of us, John Cornyn, I wouldn't piss on that fucker <laughs> if he was on fire. <laughs> I remember President Bush told me one time he'd, uh, he'd see Cornyn and he'd call him, uh, hey, Corn, or something like that. And I'd say, oh, he got a phone call later. Hey, I, I, I don't call me that. <laughs> <laughs> he told when the he president governor, that? When he was governor, oh, oh. uh, he said, hey, Corn, how you doing? Uh, hey, hey, uh, go, uh, you know, Mr. Bush, don't, call, don't be calling me that. <laughs> if I see John Cornyn, yeah. he was going to be wishing I'd call him Corn because I'm going to say something else. <laughs> I just don't know what it's going to take before we it's start gonna, holding these people accountable. Nah, nah. Blood be spilled. That's scary, though. I hate it to is. say that, but uh, I wrote someone last night, and they, they asked the same question, and I said there will be blood someday. Yes, it's going to happen. Or we're going to give away everything. We're just going to sit yeah. back and think. The sad thing is there's so many fucking liberals in this country. Yeah. I don't care what you do for a living. I don't care how much money you got, but you got to have some balls and you got to have a backbone. Yes, yes. And we got so many people that don't have one. And I don't understand if, if, if Biden was doing a great job for our country, mm -hmm. I don't like the fucker, but I would have a hard time saying Absolutely. anything. Right? I'd go if to work was, and be happy. If, if, if he was, if he was in it for America, yes, I despise him, but I'd say, okay, more power to yeah. you. Like Obama. Right. So these people but, that hey. hate Trump, he done a great job, so why would That's you right. bitch about it? If you why don't would you hate the man? I mean, I've had people tell me, I would never vote for Trump. I'm going, look, you got to understand. you got to look at the big picture. He's a Yankee. Mm -hmm. He has that attitude, but he loved this country. He did things to make, to make America great and to, for people to prosper. I said, you don't worry about his personality as being, a, uh, you know, someone from the north and the northeast. Yeah, I didn't like his tweets and stuff, but... Hey, look at the big picture, big what picture. he did for America. That, that's exactly right. There's well, I guess that's right. Yeah, well, yeah, I know it's right. Yeah. 
I, there is probably not a billionaire out there that I have anything in common with. Yeah. But I think Donald Trump could sit right here at this table with us oh, yeah, and be one I of us. Too. He I fit in too. with a regular person. Absolutely. And the people that I know that know him, they all say the same thing, too. Mm-hmm. I, I know people that have worked for him. Mm-hmm. I said, man, he's a great guy. He's one of the guys, you know. He, yeah. He's one kind of guy that would come down in the bottom where the plumbers all were and sit and bullshit with yeah. you. Yeah. He understood what – he had the hip pulse of what was going on in this country. Yes. These yes. other people don't. No. I used to think George Bush Jr. did. I don't I, anymore. I think he sold I, us out a long time ago. I'm, I'm, I'm just disappointed. Yeah, and I'm you know him. He was I, a friend of I yours. Him, yes. And I, I know a lot of people that were friends with him that have said the same thing, but they said it's not the same guy they knew 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And I just don't – I just – I, I never understood how someone could talk shit about you the way the Obama did about Bush, and then Bush sit there and be buddy buddies with him on all Ooh, the shit he talked about of him. I couldn't I do that couldn't shit. Do it. No, it'd be obvious too. Yes, if you're going to talk shit about me, then we ain't going to be friends. That's right. That's right. You know, like I would not expect Bill Clinton to come in here and Hillary to sit with me because I've said some <laughs> shit about him, and if he it's, knew it, I meant what I said, and I'd say it to his face. It's like uh, it's like whenever you get the uh, the the senators and the, and the representatives. You know, either in Republicans talking about one of their constituents or one of their uh, on the opposite aisle. You know, they're they're uh, uh, the the liberal over there, the Democrat, and they'll say, you know, uh, my good friend. I'm going. Yeah, that's a damn lie. Mm-hmm. Well, we that's had a, a, don't be saying that. We had a secret. He's the, they're the enemy. We had a Secret Service guy hunt with us, and he said that's not true. He said when they leave that TV deal, uh-huh. they sit in hot tubs, they go work out together, they have dinner together. Yeah. So it's like a wrestling match. All he, was secret. he he was he was work, it was during twenty it was after the sixteen so he worked he was the Democrats uh, Secret Service so he got in charge he was put on Hillary uh-huh. he was put on Bernie for a while but oh, anyway God. he was he was in and out and um, he said yeah he said <clears throat> you see him on TV and they're sparring you know one another and he uh-huh. said as soon as it's over there's a, there's a steakhouse right next to the Capitol they all go. Sure. Buddy, buddy, buddy. Yeah, they it's all a wrestling dinner. match. He said they go work out together. They're in the sauna together, oh, that's and they're bullshit. like, "Well, here's right. I wouldn't. I wouldn't." And I wouldn't he said they it. even like they'll even go as far as like telling them like, "This is what I'm going to hit you on." Oh, good so you gracious. need to. Oh, good gracious! You need to have a response. So it's oh, a it's God. a wrestling script because oh, they're all getting God. paid. It's a oh. job to get paid, and see that's what people in America don't see. They think Lindsey Graham, that son of a bitch, he really is for Lindsey Graham's fucking for Lindsey Graham. Mm-hmm. You know, Mitch McConnell's for Mitch McConnell. I agree, totally. and so is Charles Schumer. Oh, oh Chucky! All, yeah. Oh my God! I got, yeah, I got a friend of I mine. I despise him. I do too, and I got a friend of mine that knows him, and he told me he said. He's a likable motherfucker when you meet him in person. <laughs> I'm I go, sure what? they're all likable. He goes, no, he said, that's how, he said very that's how nice. they get elected. He said, I'm telling you right now, if you sit down and you had lunch with him, you'd think, yeah. this guy's all right guy. He'll stab he you goes, in the back. Oh, in a heartbeat. But he said, man, when he's talking to you, uh-huh. you're the most important person in the room. He'll make you feel well, like you're the only person. Politician. That's right. Yeah. But he said, that's the way he gets by with people. And they just, oh, he's like, oh, man, yeah, you're just, a, you're from Texas. Oh, man, them, them Dallas Cowboys and boy, or just uh-huh. everything you talk about, he bring it up something to make you uh-huh. feel important. Uh-huh. Because that's why he works around. They're psychopaths. Yeah. Like, if you look at the definition of a psychopath, Mm -hmm. that's them. Have you seen this video of Trump? He was holding the, um, it was at NATO, or it was was about NATO. I'll pull it up over here if I can. Um, But it was the, let me see. He's on the German, he's on Germany's ass about their contributions to NATO. Uh He's like, you keep asking for more money. Or you want the United States to protect you from Russia, but you're not contributing anything. Uh-huh. I remember that. I mean, he he chews on his ass for about seven minutes <laughs> about how unfair it is. And now I love I now love. Let me see if I can get to where. But he, he just, and that's the, that's the kind of thing that we need. We need somebody that would. That's the person we need. He's, Which we're paying for right uh-huh. now. Into the of Russia. So we're supposed to protect you against Russia, but they're paying billions of dollars to Russia, and I think that's very inappropriate. And the former chancellor of Germany is the head of the pipeline company that's supplying the gas. Uh, ultimately, Germany will have almost 70% of their country control. He gets pissed off here at the end. Like he starts waving his hands at this guy. Uh-huh. 
His guy's like, oh, my God, you actually have balls, and you're a politician. I mean, he's still just on uh -huh. his ass. You know, there's a reason that Russia didn't pull this shit while he was in Oh, yeah. They, oh, waited, yeah. they waited for they, Biden to get up there. What? But, I mean, it's exactly right. He got that guy face-to-face -face and was like, listen, I'm going to tell you what I don't like yeah. about what you're doing. Can you imagine Biden getting up there no. and getting that deep into why, you know? They, you know I mean, everybody he, knows he, that. He couldn't. They he send, couldn't the, laughing, they what send the laughing hyena over there yeah. and shoot this shit. Oh, yeah. You know what? That right there, their meeting— that's the kind of meeting we'd have in town somewhere if there was a debate, if you were in a negotiation with someone, if you was buying fertilizer and use a wheat company or whatever it yeah, was. Yeah. That's the kind of negotiation you'd have. You know, you're going to do business with him, but then you want me to do, you're going to talk like a man and we're going to do things the right way. Right. A, right. Lot, yeah. a lot bigger stage. Sure. But they're not used to nobody talking to them like that. They're that's used right. to someone saying, well, I'll tell you what, what stock company is that? Okay, well, no, you're going to give us a million shares of this stock and we're going to give it to my son in law here. Uh huh. And then we're going to do this, and then we're going to push y'all ten billion dollars back. But I want you to push back a half million dollars to someone to give to so and so's campaign, exactly. so and so campaign, exactly and that's the problem happening. we have in the country. And we have people with no balls that's right. in this world. And, and I guarantee, I'm with you, Lindsey Graham. He he just, I mean, that's that's the biggest fraud. Yeah. Now you know, I saw him come out today. I I don't like hypocrites. If you're, oh if no, you, you be honest. No. If you're an asshole about something, be an asshole about it all the time. Yeah, don't be yeah. a hypocrite. Lindsey Graham, when uh, Kavanaugh was running for Supreme Court, uh -huh. said, every time y'all stuck up a Supreme Court nominee, I voted for him because it's a respectful thing to do. You're uh -huh. the president. You get to put someone up. If they're a good person, I'm going to vote for him. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to play this charades. Mm -hmm. He's come out now. He's not voting for this black lady that Biden put up. Really? They've got the votes. Well, don't waste fucking time and spend $10 million. Yeah. The lady's going to get done in anyways. Do you think she'll get in? I think so. I don't. I, I can't oh, imagine we don't have the vote for. Her. I don't even know nothing about her because I really don't give a shit because it's. I've read it's, about her and she's bad. But we got she's we got bad. bad up in there. But she won't be a vote that's going to make a difference. Well, you know, in speaking of the Supreme Court, you know why? My question is why didn't they didn't they choose to investigate that election? Because they're bought and paid for. Because John Roberts, Chief Justice John Roberts, is bought and sold by the deep state. They've got something on his daughter, his son, they his wife, something. him. they got something on him. He flipped a switch. He was voting against Obamacare the day of, the night, or the night of, and the then, next morning voted next against day. it. He yeah. got a phone call from the CIA that said, listen, Jack, if you do this shit, this is going to happen to you. My God. You think Anthony Scalia died out there and oh, yeah. over no reason at all? Oh, yeah. yeah. And what are we going to do here? We're going to go ahead and cremate him real fast. Uh -huh. Who the fuck cremates somebody <laughs> that fast? Uh -huh. You ever heard of that? Gosh, we man. found a dead guy out here not long ago. Do you think they cremated him that night? Hell no, they didn't. <laughs> uh, I, I was I was just so disappointed. I've told lots of people. I said that you know the the Biden listening to him every time I I have to listen to that stupid idiot. If I if I have to, got a few minutes, I that I will listen to him. And I tell everybody the Supreme Court and Pence. It's on their shoulders. Pence signed off on that so quickly. Yeah, the results of that election. And I'm going, whoa, 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 what's going on here? And then the Supreme Court goes, no, we're not going to question it. Hold it. Yeah, it's a huge part Hold of our country, it. and they didn't do it. And it's on, their, it's on their shoulders. Everything that's happening, the gas prices, everything, the, the grocery prices, it's all on their shoulders. The Supreme Court is a lifetime position. Mm -hmm. They make a quarter of a million dollars a year probably. Mm-hmm. They have a private jet at their disposal at all times. They have armed secret armed guards with them at all time. Yeah. What I mean, that they're just status quo. They don't care. Yeah. Twenty that, plus years, you get one hundred and thirty five. Oh, that's all they make. Ten to tw that's what this says. I thought oh, wait, I figured they make more than hold that. Hold on, hold on. That might be for Texas. No, that's yeah. The federal uh, Supreme Court. <coughs> figure he's giving me make a quarter of a million a year. Yes, two eighty. Two hundred eighty thousand a year. A yep. private jet that you can use anytime you want to with a stock bar like Pelosi's private jet she uses. Wow. And, and I mean, it's they're set for everything they want to do. And 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 and, and, and what uh, uh, Trump put what three of them in there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one and, of them. And, and one the uh, didn't all three of them vote against him uh, the election? Uh, uh, I think one of them did. No, well, I think I think two. Of them. I think the lady did. The ladies. Uh, well, John ladies. Roberts always votes with the liberals because yeah, he's right, not a conservative. Right. He's a George Bush appointee. Yeah. 
I, th- I think the the uh, Merrick Gar- or not Merrick Garland, uh, Kavanaugh and the chick, whatever I can't remember her name. Yeah, she, they they voted to, they voted to, to accept the, the election. Um, I think I had a point I was going to ask you about, and I cannot think of what it was. Oh, I tell you what it was. Have you ever seen House of Cards on Netflix? I have. You, you watched it. I've watched it. It's been so long ago. I don't remember much about it. I think House of Cards was based on the Clintons to a degree. Probably, except, yeah, except, I can see that. Except Slick Willie is not gay. He's <laughs> opposite of that. <laughs> where, no, it's obvious. <laughs> where Spacey is gay. But, you know, yeah. Spacey and Clinton both went to Epstein Islands together. Uh-huh. They flew together. Uh-huh. But I think that show was based on how – I think politics yeah. is really a lot like House of Cards. You're a oh, freshman I representative. It. I don't doubt it. You come in there, no matter what your background is, and the first thing they do – they get you on cocaine or with a hooker or they do something where they got leverage on you. And then they own you for the rest of your deal. And they may not mess with you for 12 years. Mm -hmm. And they're going to keep getting you elected as long as you vote on the stuff Mm -hmm. they wanted to. Mm -hmm. But as soon as they need you, they're going to use you. I totally agree. And I think that's what's happening in Washington, D.C. Well, what did we see? The Epstein was him and what's her name? Was it Giselle? It's not Giselle. Whatever it is. Maxwell? Yeah, the pimp. Maxwell, yeah, yeah. She was, they were both at a cabin that is owned by the Queen of England. Isn't that right? Yeah, her her her, her son was in the middle of all that. Yes. Oh, yeah. The Queen of England, Jeez. I watched the show The Crown, and uh-huh. it's a show, and uh-huh. it's the obviously a show, but it was interesting because there's a lot of history on there, like mm-hmm. her dealings with Winston Churchill and her dealings yeah. with her and Margaret Thatcher did not get along at all. Okay. And, and, and it was a really interesting show, and I've enjoyed that series. But the Queen of England, I don't think is is – if anyone has ever lost a lot in her life, she has. She's the biggest loser in the world. They own yeah. when she took over as queen, they had two thirds of the globe they controlled, and now they own very little. Yeah, yeah. So she's not done a very good job of keeping the monarch together. Yeah. But her husband was an evil fucker. Prince William was it William? Was that his name? Mm. Or Philip. Prince Philip. 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 They just yeah. died. He was an evil dude. Evil, yeah. evil, evil. And I think he was involved in all that child sex trafficking shit. Good gracious. I think all that stuff. I think it's all the Clinton. That's so disturbing. And what's crazy about the deal with the Clintons is, is Bill Clinton didn't grow up a, 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 with a lot of means, and he's a poor kid from Hope, yeah. Arkansas. But he's a sorry son of a bitch. He's as sorry as you get. Yeah. But he was he's in with that Ivy League stuff. Uh-huh. uh-huh. I think he went to Yale, didn't he? Uh, I'd have to I think work. him and Bush both uh, went to Yale. He went to uh, uh, Clinton also went over to uh, England to that uh, Cambridge. Uh, I can't, one of those Ivy Leagues over there I in think England. It's Cambridge, maybe. I think that's the old English school. Yeah. He did go to Yale, he and did. then he went. Um, was he Skull and Bones? I'm sure they all are, Jeff. You know about <coughs> the Skull and Bones? I've heard of it. The fraternity that the Bushes have. You know, the story is, is that George Prescott Bush, mm-hmm. which was the grandfather, who's got a beautiful place in Maine. I've been to his place in Maine. Ooh, mm-hmm. it's a beautiful place. Anyways, he he supposedly come to Fort Seal and stole Geronimo's head. Really? The skull, and they have it hidden in Yale at a private place they go to. That's the that's the story. Wow. Is that he was in, and that was in 1908. What gets me about the thing is that this deep state, everybody's like, oh, it keeps going back to the Illuminati's, blah, blah. How in the hell in 1850s did they have a clue what was going to be going on in 2020? Yeah. So, see, I yeah. don't buy into all of that stuff, but I, mm-hmm. I think people of means have definitely. Yeah. Yeah. What were you it's, reading the other day that you were talking about the Indians and the way that they wouldn't show emotion? Oh, an Indian, back to the Indians. The Indians would. If, if, if they cut your liver out uh-huh. while you were alive uh-huh. and then they kidnapped one of your guys and they cut his heart out while it was still beating mm-hmm. and he wasn't supposed to cry or scream or nothing at all because Indians were taught you never show. Yeah, very stoic. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and they said even the little kids would do that. If they got hurt bad, they'd never cry. Yeah. And it was, but there's nothing that you could do to an Indian that would upset them. Mm-hmm. There was no emotion about it. Like if you killed sixteen braves and you and you you yeah. set them on fire and burned them at a stake and yeah. they just miserable death, that was okay. The only ones that howled were the were the were the uh, were the women. You know, they yes. they put up a big yes. But they would. Um, there's nothing you could do to one Indian tribe that yeah. they would just do something worse to you. So it just kept getting yeah. worse yeah. and worse. The torture, right? Right. But it but it was ex- it was accepted. Mm-hmm. It was never log- it was like in our society today. If you do something bad to somebody, like uh. One of the things they would do is when they would do these kidnappings, they would kidnap these children. Mm-hmm. Well, they didn't want to raise a baby. 
Right. So they would just right. drag them behind a horse till they were dead. Right, right. And that was your head against the, a tree. Yeah, yeah, just very common. No big deal. It was nothing, no yeah. no emotion at all to take a, an infant by his ankles and swing yeah. him into a fucking tree. And yeah. he dead. And if he didn't die, they'd leave him there and let the wolves eat him. Yeah. Jeez. And that was that was not think of. Now, if yeah. you were six or seven or eight, like that's when you could like be Cynthia Ann Parker. Yes. yes. They, they, could, uh, they could brainwash you, basically. And man, they said that uh, um, that once these kids got a taste of the freedom. Mm hmm. And uh, and see and they were once they were accepted into the tribe, that uh, that they were treated just like the other Indian children, and the other uh, the Indian children were allowed to just do whatever they wanted to do. They were never punished, never talked down to. They were just allowed to just be free. And that once these young white boys and girls, or not white boys, the girls had a terrible time of it, but they loved that life. And I have that that book about uh, what the captive, I believe. And it's about uh, this um, when they retrieved several of those those kids way back, you know, in the 30s, and they they interviewed some of them, and they said we didn't want to come back. Mm -hmm. We wanted to live with the Indians. We love that life, and uh, and it's kind of like I, I can see their point of view uh, in my, after I left Tech and was living out there at Batch Camp. Man, I love that life. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Uh, I didn't have to deal with anybody. You know, on weekends I'd go in and get gas and come back out there, and I was free to do what I wanted to do. I had hundreds of thousands of acres to hunt on. You never heard another rifle shot. You didn't hear it. See anybody hunting? I was the only guy out there. Now, that's something that I re I I will revisit often in my mind as the great years of my life. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine why those kids being raised say from 12 years old to about 16 and and they had that 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 uh, period of freedom they didn't want to give it up no even though even though that transition period once they were caught in that transition period to whenever they were actually trusted so they could begin that that uh that window of time that they were free before they were brought back to civilization uh they would quickly forget and it toughen them up and then they got to live that free life, I wouldn't want to go back either. Did you have a transition period in your life whenever you left from out there and kind of, quote, unquote, I did. came back to society? I did. In fact, I, 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 didn't, I wouldn't get a job for several months because I'd saved up money. I just wanted to stay being free. Right. I just yeah. wanted to be a vagabond. <laughs> <laughs> just a sorry vagabond. I understand. Yeah. When, when, when hunting season's over in February, uh -huh. the month of February is Jeff's month. Jeff don't want to do nothing but what Jeff wants to do because he's yeah. been tied down for a long time. Yeah. Jeff's wife, Michelle, uh -huh. she doesn't always real happy with Jeff when he was in that month of freedom. <laughs> well, see, mine started first first of March. That's whenever I, I would have to hang all my traps up. But from, from November until – in fact, I started mourning, basically mourning in mid-February because you could hear the spring birds yeah. and you feel the weather change. You were out there so long, you could actually be a part of the land. You go, wait a minute, things are changing. Yeah. It's, it's, and, and I know my time here is limited. And I remember in that cabin I lived in, I drew on a door there, uh, a coyote in a trap. And I had double mountains in the background because I remember seeing every day on that trap line, I'd see double mountains in the distance. And there was a fence line that rolled over the hills toward Double Mountain. And this coyote was in this trap. And he was sitting there. And you could see Double Mountains in this fence line. And I wrote beneath it, to this end I too shall pass. Wow. Meaning that I will be caught mm -hmm. up with normal life. And that freedom I used to know will be over. Mm -hmm. And and they re they re they they uh, went out and and did some repairs on that cabin and they painted over that oh, oh shit. man they that's painted sad. over that that's sad. i sat there one <laughs> night by a kerosene lantern and drew that really and it, and and i can i can see it right now the coyote was sitting on his haunches and he's got a number four new house he's got one foot in it and he's kind of growling and he's looking and you can see the double mountains and i have written uh beneath it to this end i too shall pass would you ever like take a picture of something like have do you ever take a picture of a coyote in a trap have you ever not done anymore that i used to all the time when i was trapping that would have been one that would have been i've got one i've got one that was in a texas monthly it was uh they wrote a story uh, it's called uh coyote wars mm -hmm. 
and uh, and they called me and they said, do you have a picture of a coyote in a trap? And I had one. I still remember where I took it. It was in J2 pasture. Still remember it was an overcast day, rainy, and this coyote was very, very aggressive. And he was so aggressive, I actually stopped pulling my old, my old uh, Canon TL out with a 50 millimeter 1.8 lens and Kodachrome 64 and kneeled down and took that photograph. Mm -hmm. And it was chosen, it was published in Texas Monthly, and it was chosen as one of the one of the great pictures in 25 years wow. of Texas Monthly. And I was looking at it just the other day. And, uh, and I mean, it, it defined defiance. He was... It defined, I've, you've got me, but I ain't giving up. <laughs> I mean, his old teeth were bare, and he was about a, about a five-year-old male, and those ears were back, and those eyes just, they, they were firing hate. It was just like tracers out of a, out of a machine gun. And, I mean, it, it, to this day, it speaks to me. But, no, I used to, but anymore, all I do is take pictures of the ones I call them. In fact, I, I was out just a couple of days ago and spent all morning Got some great pictures of coyotes coming to a call. You ever let them go? I, I I've let a lot of coyotes go out of traps. You have? I have lots of them. You ever had one almost eat your ass while you're getting it out of it? Oh, every one of them. <laughs> and especially big males. Every once in a while you'll get a female that'll fight you, but but um, uh, I've gotten into a couple of pretty pretty stout situations with them. I had one big male behind the Benjamin Lake Dam. I was trapping for cats, and I caught this big male. And I got tangled up in a mesquite shrub with him. He was all wrapped up in a mesquite shrub, and I got in there to try to get him out. I was going to let him go. And I did let him go eventually. But uh, I got off balance. And, of course, I had him by the mouth hmm. and, uh, and had his <laughs> mouth shut but with, my, with, with one hand. And I was trying to grab his, like his, his, around his flank with my other hand, and he was trying to pull back. And I couldn't, I couldn't get a good grip on him. And it was like, it was like, Man, don't let that thing go, because <laughs> I can't get out of here, and uh, and it's gonna be it's gonna be a real circus. Well, bitten, getting bit by a dog is a fucking worse too. Well, uh, yeah, that that coyote was was wanting a piece of my butt. That's what I'm saying. That's nothing yeah. worse than getting bit yeah. by a dog. And I, but I finally got my my balance more toward <laughs> him, where I could put more weight on him, and got the trap off his foot, and then I pitched him out to the other side, and then he looked at me and turned. And I've had him actually come around and like half circle me all bowed up i remember i caught one one day on the wichita in a number 114 new house which is a, actually a wolf trap but I'd, I'd i'd set a few of them just because i wanted to say i'd set them and they're big big traps big jaws on them with teeth and uh and i'd caught a big big male uh, you know he was pushing 40 pounds and uh and i got him out <laughs> i remember it was an overcast wet day and that old coyote was bowed up and he just kind of eased around me just kind of kind of checking me out even though he had that foot look like a pancake hmm. and he finally turned trotted off and left me alone <laughs> we had a guy on with us last yeah. week that's a trapper Corey alkerton yeah. and he's does uh, wolf trapping out in canada okay yeah he was pretty interesting talking about how wolves are creepy animals anyways mostly in big old canadian wolves like he, the he said nine. they were up in the bush up in the tundra trapping wolves and mm -hmm. they had set traps came back to camp mm -hmm. and he said they woke up he woke up in the morning to take a leak sun was up and he said there was a trail in the snow where they just circled that camp all night seeing what seeing what they were i'll be darned but he said well, after that after he saw like, that he slept with a 22 the rest of yeah. the trip well you know there's never been and I, I used to read i mean i used to study i wrote research papers at tech on wolves and stuff unless they were rabid there has never been a documented case up until 1974 that i know of that, that actually is in, in written form of a healthy wolf actually attacking someone, going after them, attacking really? them to kill. A lady in There's, Montana the other day just recently got ate up some jogger yeah. by somewhere. It's, I'm sure it's not Montana, but it was somewhere. She yeah. just got attacked by a bunch of wolves. Now, mountain lions yeah. are real famous. Oh, yeah, real that. famous. But that, that was in like up till 1974. And that's that when crazy, I got though? I wonder what it I don't know what the deal is. While we're talking about animals, I, I noticed, I saw something the other day I hadn't seen in a long time, a bobcat. I haven't seen bobcats yeah. like I used to see. Are you, They're you there. They are there. They Believe me, they are there. I, when I used to trap, I remember one winter um, I caught 103 bobcats in 59 days, and I never saw one. Wow. Wow. I never saw one. 
out of a trap. But I've never. But I, I caught 103 in 59 days. But Ooh. I usually see them, you know, here or there, especially when you go. Now, one thing I don't see no more is we don't have the near the old homesteads we used to have in no, the country. No, no, they're gone. No. They bulldozed them down yep. and stuff. Yep. And that makes me sad. Every time I go by a place, they bulldoze an old yep. homestead down mm-hmm. with, the, you know, just a little half acre of trees and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Man, you're killing the wildlife in the area. Yeah. Yeah. But but yeah. I used to see bobcats around all them. We don't have as many of them. But I ha- I don't right. see near the bobcats yeah. out on the road I used to see. Yeah. I believe me, they're out there. I was calling the other day. It's real funny, uh, with the camera, and uh, I just gotten a couple of really, really outstanding coyote pictures. Man, I mean, I, in fact, I'm I'm uh, I'm working with a designer right now on my new book coming out in uh, this next fall. Um, and so I was calling, and I just called up this coyote, got a great shot of him in mid jump in the air, and it didn't have any vegetation obscuring him. I mean, he was coming right at me about 25 yards. 400 millimeter lens it was fantastic so i was pretty elated and i'd been there about nine minutes or so and i thought ah you know it's probably that's all i'm going to get here so i i reached down to sort of push myself <coughs> up and i thought i'm going to give it one more minute mm-hmm. and i sit back down and i hit that call again with my mouth call and i looked to my left and there stood a big tom bobcat about 40 yards away just his head back in the shadows and I went, I'll oh, be damn, there's a cat. That's what, and I've been needing some cat pictures. Mm-hmm. And so I started uh, started trying to coax him out, and I knew not to move. I just left my camera pointed straight ahead because he had me zeroed in. I mean, he had me nailed. And so I was, uh, I was uh, coaxing him and just little mouth squeaks. And, you know, I could not see that cat move. I did not see an actual movement, right. but I could but see the light did. coming on his face. There was a ray of light right in front of him, and I could not tell that that cat was moving, but I could see that light appearing on his face. And I went, that That's cat's crazy. moving to me. Yeah. And so as he appeared in that light, I started shooting photographs. And instead of being like a coyote, just breaking and running, he just kept coming. He just came, And finally, he just broke into a little walk and trotted up from here to the corner right there from me. Dang. And stood there, and I sat there and photographed, and finally I just went, I got enough of you. And I just stood up <laughs> and he just turned and just started walking away. So how, what's your setup like? Do you have, you got your camera on like a tripod, gillied up? Or no, how, no, no, no. How do no, you, how do no, you do no. it? I, I, I just walk up and sit down and I've got my mouth calls around my neck and I just hold the camera just like I would a rifle uh-huh. and get it ready. And I've got the call in my right okay. hand and I sit there and call and then I'll drop the call. If I feel like something's coming, generally a coyote's going to come within five minutes. Five minutes. About five minutes. If it, anything after five minutes, your your chances start to really drop in getting something in. Now, mm-hmm. a cat will come, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. You know, I will not sit longer than that. Sometimes I'll sit 20. If it's in a really outstanding cat habitat, I may give it 20 minutes, especially if it's real beautiful country. Mm-hmm. And it's like, God, I just, you know, I love this spot. I'm just going to sit a little longer. But but generally, all of my my cats come in within within ten minutes, right? And so uh, and so I'll I'll just sit there, and if I feel like something's in that first five minutes is real critical, and I'll drop the call, and I'll just grab the camera and get ready because a coyote's generally going to come in pretty hard, and he's going to be there right quick on you, and so you need to keep an eye, and when he turns his head, you know you point your camera at him and get him right. in get him in in the viewfinder and get ready. Mm-hmm. You don't start shooting photographs when he's out there at 40 yards. Don't do that. You let him tighten up because once you start shooting, unless you've got a mirrorless camera, he picks up on that, and, I mean, he'll just shut down, and then, boom, he's gone. He'll pick up on, on what? On that the, camera the, going off. The click? The click of the camera. Now, mirrorless cameras, and I don't have one. I'm not going to pay $5,000 for one. I've got all the camera gear I need <laughs> for the rest of my life. I've got tens of thousand dollars worth of gear, and I'm not going to spend five, 7000 on a new Canon mirrorless camera or 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 five thousand dollars or three thousand dollars for a new 100 400 uh, millimeter lens i'm not going to do it i've got you know one dx and i've got a 100 to 400 and it's all i need and i know how to handle a coyote right. and i let them get in a certain distance and i can get all the pictures i want but uh, but cats are real different cattle once he once he start he or she starts in especially a female now, a male is, is, is tougher to call in. Female will come in pretty readily, and she'll, she'll come in tight. In fact, in fact, I was calling uh, just recently up on the Canadian River with a magazine editor, 
And uh, and I know it was a female. I could tell by its face the instant I saw it because it was it was there for an instant. I was calling, and, and the guy with me, had we were shooting on that day, and he shot. I heard him shot, uh, shoot a coyote. And for some reason, I just I didn't hear anything. Maybe I did, but yeah. something made me look over my right shoulder. And there was a cat about 10 yards at a dead run at me and an absolute dead run as fast as a bobcat runs. And I turned and I hollered and said, get out of here. And that cat hit on its front feet and turned in midair and was Shot gone back. instantly. Had I not turned around, I guarantee that cat would have been on me. I guarantee. And I've been jumped on once yeah. by one. And that's enough. And, and I've, I've, had to, I've had some of them, you know, within 18, 20 inches of me running. Right. And so uh, that right there was a good thing I looked over my right shoulder. Now, why do why do female bobcats come in easier? Because I, they have to I do not understand. Care for young? I don't understand. But they will come in, and those are the ones that jump on you. The females. Every one that I've had to shoot off of me. Yeah. Uh, every one of them were females. And I've had to shoot probably, I'd say five or six, off of me, or scare them so bad that they stopped. That they were coming so hard, I know they would have probably come. You know, it'd been a collision. Yeah. They've been females. I wonder what that is. I wonder I if it's I don't know. that they have to tend to their young and they need the perhaps cut, so. maybe more play it a little bit a little bit more loose because they've got perhaps cubs so. they have to take care of. What do you notice any behavioral differences in male and female coyotes? No, no, no. they're mm -hmm. pretty well. They pretty well act yeah. the same. Um, uh, probably. Uh, no, no, they really don't because I keep uh, you know <coughs> of course. Each year, I will take 15 or 20 coyotes just to keep my journals going. Right. And I'm, right now, I'm assessing this last winter. And I think I've called up uh, 100, maybe 110 or 115 coyotes this, this season. Mm -hmm. And I'm fixing to shut down because it's March and they're not looking good, you know, for pictures. So I'm fixing shaggy to, I'm fixing, they're getting shaggy looking. Yeah. And so, um, but it always runs about, about on, the, on the shot ones, the ones I actually harvest. It runs about 60, 40, you know, 50, 50, something like that. Really? Have you, uh, did you see the pictures of the Jaguar in New Mexico? I did. Have you ever seen a Jaguar? No. I wonder if that's something in the future we're going to see more and more of in New Mexico. If they're getting to be more widespread. It could be. It could be. I think that's you know? pretty neat. Oh, what, I think it is. What, I think it's cool. Are they a 50 pound cat? Oh, no. Jaguars? No, they're big boogers. So they're a lot bigger than that then? They're big, massive animals, yes. They're, 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 they will kill you. How, how big do they get? They, I, I'm not sure um, if uh, Andy's probably looking it up, but trying to find it. I know that they're they're way more dangerous than a mountain lion in a, in a corner position situation. I saw a really neat picture. I guess it was on the Rio Grande, maybe, or one uh, of those that was rivers. an old photograph that I saw. That was an old photograph. I mean, I bet we saw the same one. Uh, probably by, rocks, by prob water. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think that was an old photograph. I know that they're starting to make start to make a rebound. Now the one, now wait a minute. The one that I saw was in Arizona. Because this one I saw was, was in New Mexico. Was he was he drinking water, or was he had, had, he, be, had he been treed? No, he wasn't in tree. He was going or down on a rock. rock. He was on a rock. Okay, but I bet it's the same pitch. It's probably the same. We know how yeah. it is. Yeah, but someone did tree one. I read that. And that was an old that was an old uh, lion hunter out in Arizona, and he treed one. Yes, and he let it go. Yes. Oh yeah, it better because I imagine he'd gotten big trouble. Well, some some jackass shot three whooping cranes up around uh, up in Oklahoma, <laughs> north of Al or west of Altus or east of Altus. I mean, they, they haven't arrested. They haven't found them. You're kidding? No, they, well, you know, hey, we can't find out Hunter La Biden's laptop, so maybe we can't get into the guess bottom so. of that. I figured they'd nail they'd yeah. figure this stuff out. They had some people of interest, but they haven't. In they have not arrested anybody on that. Really? Three whooping cranes. Boy, if they find those, they'll have to shoot beans to them with a 30 30. <laughs> <laughs> and be so far in jail. <laughs> That's no shit. <laughs> now, Jaguars, they were around here back in the day, weren't they? Uh, early, way back. Way, yes. way back. Yes. Did you look how much they weigh? They killed oh. a Jaguar near Gulfway, Texas, back around 1900. Really? Ooh. Yes. Wow. Yes. That's, that was in Texas Parks and Wildlife Magazine years ago. When it used to be a real magazine. <coughs> well, you can't find very many of them anymore. Uh -uh. That's a shame. Oh, it's a crying shame. I miss reading the newspaper. 
I used to yeah, love to read a newspaper. Yeah, I used to yeah. read the Dallas Morning News. Yeah. I'd start with the sports, then read the. Yeah. I, I used to love to read the paper. Yeah, I read it every day as well. Um, I'm trying to find out how much they weigh, but I'm not finding anything. Uh, the trapper fellow that we had on, he said that wolves, you can't hardly get a coyote to break a stick because they're very, very particular. They're very conscious about making noise. Oh but, yeah. But he said a wolf. Oh he, Jesus. He just, doesn't walks, care. Just, just, he'll he just walk walks, straight because he knows he's the king of the woods. Yeah. He knows yeah. that there's nothing out there yeah. that he can't handle. So he'll break yeah. limbs. He'll run into trees. But he said he said a coyote. He said they're just very quiet in, yeah. the, in their yeah. approach. Um, 212 pounds. Oh, 212 yeah. pounds. There yep. you go. Kill you in yeah. an instant. But I didn't know that there was that big of a difference. And it made sense whenever he explained it. Like, a wolf's mm -hmm. not afraid of anything that's out there. Well, you know, they basically, for the most part, they hunt in, in packs. And so they're just going to go around and bullying, mm -hmm. you know, and doing what they want to do. Whereas mm -hmm. coyotes are kind of, you know, they're kind of solitary animals, basically. Do all coyotes lose? Do they all kind of get that mange look starting this time of year? Or do some of them keep well, their... Well, they start, they start what they call in the fur market, they call, uh, uh, oh, it's, it, it starts at their hips. Like shedding? Uh, it's not shedding. Their hair starts nodding up. Okay. Oh. And the, the instant that appears, back in the fur days, we watched for that. Back back in the late 70s. When they start breaking, it always starts breaking in their hips. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, the instant it starts, You're boom. Done. I mean, it's it's like that coyote's not hardly. It's worth half as much or even maybe a third as much as, as, a, as one that hadn't broke yet. Once it's done, it's done. What what's the bird that makes all the noise in the morning? I think it's a summer bird. It's right at thirty minutes before sun comes up. They're loud as hell. Called nature's alarm clock. Uh, you know, mockingbirds. I hear them all night long in the summer. No, this will be a, this bird's a little bird, and every morning, about thirty minutes before well, there's the sun. a cardinal. The cardinal. I hear them early in the morning. I stepped out the other night, uh, other morning, about six a.m., and I could hear cardinals. These birds I hear in the summer. Or once it warms summer. up, once it warms up, it's every morning. I mean, it's thirty minutes before the sun comes. I'd up. have to hear them, but you don't hear them in the winter time. Yeah. Now our windows aren't open either in the winter time yeah. either. So, scissor tails. Is that scissor what it tail is? fly catchers. You hear them going thump thump da dum. They make thump, a thump, oh, thump, oh, thump. That's them right yeah, there every yeah. morning. Yeah, that's scissor tail. Yes, yeah. every morning. Have you ever yeah. heard a whippoorwill? Uh, I've heard. I've heard, uh, yes. That is a have. really cool bird. It is. There's a bird uh, that I used to hear at night, and I haven't heard him in a long time. I used to hear him back in the 60s, uh, back out west of Benjamin on that old rough country out there. And and I don't know what it was, but it was a real eerie sound. And there's a poor, maybe it's a poor wheel. I'm not sure. But uh, but it kind of gave you made you, gave you a creepy feeling. The whippoorwill, my grandparents owned a house in the mountains in Arkansas, and we used to go stay in the summertime there, and yeah. you'd hear them all, whippoorwill, whippoorwill, yeah. all night Now, long. that wasn't this bird I was hearing. This was, a, this was a different cat that lived down in those canyons out, out there in Panther Canyon in that region. Big getaway, little getaway, yeah. Did the Native Americans, did they pay attention to astrology and the, and the stars and stuff like that, or was that more? That I don't know. Because you, you hear about, you know, that there's so many cultures that, would look up to the night sky and yeah. you know, they predict future and all this other bullshit. Yeah. But I didn't know if the, like the Cherokees and, and those Indians. You know, they might have traveled by the stars, um, but I don't know that they were into astrology or anything like that. Astro right. Astronomy, I mean. I yeah. We had a guy on recently and he, he's up in Wyoming and he finds buffalo skulls mm -hmm. up there. And that's his big hobby. But mm -hmm. he says you find there's these great big canyons where Indians would run them off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they yeah. they'd get yeah, they'd get stuck down there. Mm -hmm. And then he said if it if you can get down there, you'd have to repel a lot of places if mm -hmm. it's stuck in like a canyon. But so there'll be a perfectly good buffalo that's just still down there because it's below freezing all the time. Wow. Wow. And nothing can really get no predators can get to it. But <clears throat> yeah, that's his hobby is he goes and looks for wow for buffalo skulls. What were you, that one buffalo uh, herd was what? It was uh, 60 miles by 20 <laughs> miles, maybe. It was in Kansas. Which oh, that was, uh, J, uh, J. Wright Moore wrote about it in his in his autobiography. He was 19 years old, and he was on the Cimarron River. And uh, he was uh, cutting wood, I believe. And he said the southern herd had approached the Cimarron, no, it's Arkansas. It's Arkansas River. Had approached the, the Arkansas, and it took them like, I forgot how many days to cross that river. 
and they said it was 110 yards, 110 miles long, uh, wide, and oh God, I cannot remember, 10 miles deep or something like that, but it was literally the entire southern herd, which is about three and a half million. That's crazy. And that was in 1871. <laughs> what made them all gather up like that? They, that's, they, each year they would go, they would leave uh, the Kansas and the Texas northern panhandle, and as the winter progressed, they moved, they moved southward, and they would pretty well re, uh, reach the Concho River. And then by, as the weather began to change and become warmer, then they moved back. And it was that migration pattern, mm -hmm. and it was the migration of the great southern herd. And that was the southern, the northern herd stayed in the Dakotas, right? Uh, well, you know, I don't know much about the northern herd. It wasn't as large as the uh, the southern herd. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know. There was a, there was a southern herd, then there was the one in Kansas, uh, Kansas and Nebraska. And then there was uh, then then there was one in the north. I think there was either three or four different herds. And I used to have a map that was drawn, and I probably still have it somewhere in my notes that draw that that was drawn years ago. I mean, we're talking probably a century ago, and it showed how these herds overlapped in their migration patterns. But that but the southern herd was really big, and it had this really big migration. Do, Huge do you, migration. Do you feel sorry for people that don't have passions in life? Oh gosh, yeah. How, I've, I've how could you? How could you enjoy life if you don't have a passion? I don't care if it's if you're out studying grass burrs. You know, have a have a passion. I, I've never understood, and I know people huh. like that. They don't really have much passion. They just yeah. kind of go to work and every day, and I feel sorry for. I them. think my problem is I've got too many. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. and I'll get on it. My wife grabs at me because she said, "You know, you've got you'll get on something, and you get become so focused, and you'll stay on it for months, and then all of a sudden you just stop." And I said, well, I stopped because I'm done. <laughs> you got an education then, out of it. And then I start on another one. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> that's right. That's exactly right. Um, but that's what it took for you to get to where you are today. It, it, I mean, it is. It, you, it, you've, got to, you've got to have a, have a want to. I think all men have it, and I think we've a lot of them lost it. Yeah. I think a lot of them have lost their sense of adventure and yeah. their sense. Because let's face it. Well, we're, we're all saying All three of us are sitting right here, and all three of us don't live a box life. No. Mm -mm. We live life to a whole different set of rules, and That's we're right. very fortunate to be that way. Very but, fortunate. But we also chose that path when a lot of people didn't. Yeah. Um, and let's face it, the odds of you being this great photographer were slim. I mean, you, oh, look, yeah. at, you look at the Absolutely. number of people that take pictures and yeah. the people that make a living taking pictures. Yep. Yep. It's the 1% of the 1%. Well, and, and of course, in, in, in the days when I started, it was all film, mm -hmm. which was way more difficult than, than what it is today. I can tell you, I mean, making that transition from the chromes to digital, uh, I mean, I fought it because I didn't want to do it. But once I got into it, and it's just like, this is so easy compared yeah. to the chrome days. Kodachrome 25, Kodachrome 64, Velvia 50, Velvia 100, Velvia 400. I mean, that stuff was tough to shoot. Digital is child's play compared to film. Right. Literal child's play. Do you feel sorry for the people at Kodak? <laughs> I, I never really think about them. <laughs> Can you imagine the billions of dollars oh of an goodness. industry that was lost? Oh, yeah. Somewhere, and I, don't, I, can't, I can't remember where it's at, but somewhere I've been recently has an old building there, and it says Kodak on it. Really? And there was a time yeah. when it was full of people developing pictures yep. or doing stuff like that, yep. and it's an empty building it's now. Empty. I see all have those little yellow boxes. Yep. I'd send off and be a week later. I'd get them back, boy. And I mean, it was like, oh, did I do, did I get this <laughs> yeah. shot? Did I get it? Look at it. Oh God, I missed it. Throw it away. Overexposed, not focused. You know, and 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 of course, I've got you know hundreds of thousands of slides, and whenever I uh, um, uh, put one, you know, whenever I have it have it transferred into a digital form, um, you look at it. And they're not as sharp. And so digital is surrealistically sharp mm -hmm. because you cannot make a, you can, I don't care how sharp you're, uh, if I shot it with a 500, uh, four or five on tripod, you know, at 250th of a second, I used to get a hand hold down to 120 feet. I can't do it anymore. But I mean, really sharp pictures with Kodachrome or Velvia, 
and uh, and and you transfer that in digital file and you put it on on sharpen and then you take and sharpen a digital file a real digital file the, the real digital file is like nothing is that sharp mm -hmm. but that chrome that's that's real right that's for real yeah. the color is real everything is really what it should be and so I actually when I go in and tiff out a raw I really watch that because I don't want to go overboard and go, ah, that's, that's not, that, that light doesn't occur. Cause, uh, you know, I try, I'll, you got to pull it a little bit cause the raw is not real. Right. It's a little soft colors are not right. So I'll just go down and I'll go clarity, you know, a couple of little taps on clarity. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I saw. And then I may go up if a deep shadow and go, okay, I can see some hair. Boom. Stop. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I always set every, set my, um, uh, um, my, my color at like 5,600, um, uh, color temperature. And that gives you just about the right color because if you don't, uh, the light's kind of blue mm -hmm. and cold. And so that pulls it up to what it really was. And if it looks wrong, it's, that's too warm. I didn't see it like that. I'll pull it back. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but too many people don't do that. They're, they just, they just pop everything as yeah, far as they can go and it's like ah good gracious <laughs> that's not real photography is going to become a lost art though like you did because there's not going to be as many real photographers no yeah. more because they're all on digital yep. it's kind of like uh making music mm -hmm. everything's a studio now yeah you can take i have a horrible voice but if i went through a studio and they could play with my oh, voice like they can make me sound like i had uh, gary morris tell me one time he said we don't have the quality of singers that, that there used to be, like Patsy Cline. Mm -hmm. See, that was real. That was pure. Right. Uh, even old um, Ernest Tubb, as, as scratchy as his old voice, it was real. Yeah. And he said, you can go into a studio right now, and anybody can make a good song. Well, it's all auto-tune. Sure. My grandfather was telling me last night, his favorite, his favorite artist was Charlie Pride. Charlie Pride he, he saw, great. He saw Charlie Pride artist. more than probably anybody else. But he yeah. said Charlie Pride, he'd come up, he'd grab the microphone, he'd sing, he'd go from one song to the next. Sounded great. He said if they saw you in the back, you were having fun, he'd send send them a round on old Charlie up here. Really? And he said, but great there was guy. no bullshit in his yeah. in his concert. He said he'd get up, he'd sing. And if you were having a good time, he'd send you a round of drinks, yeah. and then that was it. He's in Jim Kern's book a bunch. Charlie Pride is? Yeah, because yeah. he used to own part of the Rangers yeah. and do a lot of um, Do you want a glass of wine? Uh, yeah, I might take one. But oh, you know, you know what, what gets me today is that instead of singing, and uh, I mean, I, I hate country and western music today. I despise it. I mean, I, Today's I'm, music? Yes, yes. There I'm, ain't no I'm, Waylon Jennings no more. I'm, stri I'm strictly uh, 1969 back. Back to Jimmy Rogers in 1929. I don't even know who Jimmy Rogers is. The yodeling Jimmy Rogers. I've T for heard Texas. It. T for Texas. T for Tennessee. Okay, I do know that. And uh, and but those guys, they just you watch that stuff on uh, on YouTube, and uh, and uh, Jimmy Rogers, not Jimmy Rogers because they don't have anything of him, but uh, but his music. But uh, say Arnie's Tub, they just get up there and say, you know, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is a this is uh, uh, blah, 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 and the Texas Troubadours, and they start singing. You don't like George Strait then? No. George Strait's great. He's probably a great guy. Well, I don't, I don't know about I don't, as a great I don't, guy. I don't, I don't know his music, but I'm, I'm sure he's a wonderful guy, but I don't like his music. See, I like his music. I don't know if he's a wonderful guy, but I like yeah. his music. But yeah. I don't like any of the new stuff today. Yeah. And, and they, they do more acting. What about Waylon Jennings? Oh, I like Waylon Jennings. Buddy Holly. Buddy Holly. It's some of his music I liked. He was very good. They, the world lost a great talent when they he died. did. They did. He was kind of a pioneer. He, he in was. rock and roll. He he did a lot of that. Yeah. What about? I don't think there's any wine glasses no more, Andy. I think Mom's taking all them home. I uh, just a couple do. Just an old plastic cup. I think he thinks you're above that. <laughs> Wyman said he'll have plastic cup or styrofoam. He don't care. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> he just feels bad. You hobnob with the rich people and then you hang out with us. <laughs> so everybody's the same to me. And that's why you're who you are. Um, <laughs> speaking of Ernest Tubb, he's from Benjamin, isn't he? Yes, I think he was there for about seven years. Yeah. Yeah, and his sister was thrown in our jail. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, uh, she was uh, thrown in for bootlegging. Uh, in fact, I've got the jail book, and it, it has her name in there, and it says um, uh, running whiskey. 
uh, arrested for running whiskey. I think she was in there two or three times and thrown in the penitentiary for a year. Wow. Yeah. My great grandfather was a bootlegger, and my grandpa yeah. never ever would talk about. It. He was embarrassed Thank by you. it. He had to bail his dad out. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> so, and my dad was talking about it was one of the last stories my dad told me about, which they was all embarrassed about. I don't know why. Hell, it's back then it was a different world. Oh yeah. Yeah. I it mean, was. That's good wine. That's cab. That's, that's, a, that's good wine. Decoy. That's oh, good that wine. decoy. That's yeah. a gift from my wife. That, that's some good wine. She's the she's the winer. <laughs> she's the wine the wine in, connoisseur in the group. <laughs> um, you said your your grandpa was a bootlegger, or your great grandpa was. My great grandpa got arrested for selling shine or making shine or something, and my grandfather was so embarrassed about it that him and his brother had to, or him and his sister had to bail him out. I guess. Really? <laughs> yeah. My my dad said it. You know, my grandpa was really embarrassed about it. Did the Native yeah. Americans have any drink that they would drink? Yes. Would they ferment? Ah, uh, what mezcal just, or something? Oh, mezcal. Yeah. yeah. Mescal yeah. and peyote. And, of course, of course, uh, if you read the book on, I believe it's uh, on the border with McKenzie, they tell about chasing down uh, whiskey runners that would go into the Indian Territory because when the Comanches and, and the Indians there would get drunk, they'd get mean. <laughs> and uh, the, the military, when they caught you doing it, they'd just line you up and shoot you right on the spot. Really? Yep. There is wow. nothing worse than dealing with a drunk. You manage your drunk Indian. Oh, my goodness. Oof. Yeah, whole band of them. Yeah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> and so, uh, why you think it's funny? It's true. That's a <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, the uh, the common cheros when they would come in to to trade with the Indians, and this is this is a this is also in a history book somewhere that I read. When they come out of New Mexico and they come into Texas, come into Paladier Canyon or or a Mushaway Peak or a, a Blanco Canyon, and um, they would uh, trade with the Comanches in the Kiowa. But they'd hide the whiskey. <laughs> Until the deal was made. Until the deal was made, and then they'd tell them where it was, and they'd haul butt <laughs> yes. back to New Mexico and try to get four or five days ahead of them because they knew that once they got drunk, they'd take everything away from them that they traded. Yep. I was, the, and keep what they got. <laughs> the, the book I was reading just was talking about how they would do that. And that was a very common practice, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. nobody wanted to be around a bunch of drunk Indians. Nope. Where would they get the whiskey from? They made would, it. Yeah. They made it. Yeah. They made it. They made uh, some of the ingredients was uh, was alcohol, whatever, you know, some, yeah. some sort of alcohol, a plug of tobacco, uh, a certain amount of strychnine to give you a headache. <laughs> the, the tobacco was to get you sick. Strychnine was to give you a headache. And uh, creek water, bad creek water. And you mix that up, and that was Indian whiskey. That was Indian whiskey. That was Indian whiskey. Really? Yes. And that's Strychnine. what they give them. Strychnine. Strychnine would make you sick. Mm -hmm. yeah. The first whiskeys that you're thinking about, like someone to actually bottle that would sell, like if you were watching Bananas and they went in and decided to have a whiskey, yeah. Yeah. would just be some kind of corn mash from somewhere yeah. is what they yeah. would do. I mean, there wasn't – nobody was drinking Jameson and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, obviously not. I mean, well, but, I mean, there was not a Crown Royal or – Right, you know, right. Top George shelf D shit. George it Dickel. Was, it was yeah. just a <laughs> barrel just whiskey. Yeah, it was the yeah. cheapest shit they whiskey. could get. <laughs> Kentucky Deluxe. <laughs> yeah. The cheap shit. Is but what they'd they all doing. bring it in on a train, like the, the uh, Fort Griffith. The beer's the same way. I mean, they had a supplier they that would, would – Yeah, that would make – Somebody was a, a distiller mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. in the day, but they just made cheap corn mash whiskey, and, yeah. and beer was made of – I think the Egyptians, the first thing they had was mead. I think might have been the first – the first alcohol may have been mead made yeah. out of honey for in in Egypt. Wow, I, I, th th I think I think that's where that first come from. I you know, I can't even fathom the uh, how sorry whiskey was back in eighteen seventies in these old these old hunting camps. Oh, can you imagine? Ooh, just rock guy. Oh, Rath Rath uh, Rath City, you know, up here to, near Hamlin. My goodness, they talk about at one time there were three hundred buffalo hunters camped there. Mm. And the whiskey stench. they drank. Golly, they bring those prostitutes in from Fort Griffin. We well, you know they smell good. And in, in uh, pink hide wagons. Yeah. <laughs> that, pink wa that, that, pink book, wagons. that book, that <laughs> book, that book of Bucky Nails mm -hmm. that I'm showing you, you're taking with you to read. Mm -hmm. That book talks about that. Does it talks it? about the prostitutes and all that stuff. There's some vile women back oh, there. Oh my goodness gracious! Some nasty. I bet they'd girls. whip your ass. Yeah. Well, those I would, would, be the I would not. They'd, they'd cut, cut you. you. Yeah. They'd cut you. I wouldn't want to be in a room with them. No, the stink. no. Jesus Ugh. Christ. Oh, my God. Mm. But you talk oof. about some re real regrets the next day. There's some boys <laughs> had to wake up really, really with a well, lot of regrets. Well, you know, like uh, there's one old buffalo hunter. Uh, uh, he was a skinner, and he was an, I believe he was a Scottish or an Irish boy. I don't recall his name. It's been a while since I read this book. But they were camped somewhere up 
near the Llano Estacada, and the buffalo hunter came in that morning right before breakfast and said, I just killed 69 cows a certain distance from here. And he said, oh, so-and-so over here at another camp skinned X number of buffalo. No, killed 71. He said, so-and-so in this next camp over here skinned 69 one, in one day. True. If you can skin that 71, he told us this camp cook, if you can skin the 71 I'll, and not cut a hole in the hide mm -hmm. and peg them out before nightfall, I'll give them to you. And he and he said, "There's a pile of knives over there by that by the the round uh, whetstone that they, you know, pulled by hand." He went over and sharpened those knives, and at sundown he had skinned 71 cows, didn't cut a hole, and pegged them all out. Got paid, went in, sold them, and lost it all play, uh, drinking whiskey and gambling. <laughs> no, in one night. That was very common. I'm going to tell you, there were some nasty people, too, back then. If I could go back in time and be in any deal, and I could have been a Indian, a frontiersman, or a Viking, I would be a Viking in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. You know, the Vikings took baths. Well, yeah, they had water, Jeff. Yeah. But, yeah. They, but, they, but <laughs> that was part of their deal. They had they, water. They, they were yeah. a civilization that was built around yeah. water. Yeah. But they took freaking baths. Yeah. They groomed themselves. Yeah. Once again. They, their women groomed them. Yeah. I'm thinking Once they lived again. a whole lot better life than the, But they lived in awful cold country, too. Very cold. Yeah, but they had, they had steam rooms and stuff. Yeah. They were they were tough cookies. They, they were the ones I would be if I was going to, yeah. you know. Why aren't they shunned? The Minnesota Vikings should have changed their name. There's well, some people true. that. That's true. You know, that's true. They, yeah. they, they, they were. They raped and pillaged everybody that they came right. They did. They that's were right. tough people. Yeah. Yeah. And they, do you know they were buried with their combs? Really? Like they, their with their comb. With their comb? comb? Yes. They, 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 they took so much into their bathing and their appearance and their beards and stuff. Uh -huh. They had their beards trimmed, and they waxed them, and they, they, they combed them and stuff. They would bury themselves. When they would get buried, they would get buried with their combs. Wow. For the wow. afterlife. Wow. That's Andy, Andy, Valhalla. here it is. This is 635 to 4 now. I've been right 635 times, Andy, four times, and he's going to look me <laughs> up. I'm not, I'm he's not, trying to I'm fact not, check me I'm here. Just, <laughs> I'm just looking, but it looks like a regular comb that they yeah, had. They, they did. Did you – Uh, I'm, I've been reading a lot about pirates now. That's mm -hmm. one of my new things, passions to read about. We're going to Puerto Rico in May, and I cannot wait to go to Fort San Juan. Mm -hmm. Now, you've been there, right? No. I thought you was – somebody else no. I knew had been there from our area. Anyways, the 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 pirates – the whole economy on our northeast coast was built on piracy. Really? Yes, and I did not realize that. I never even thought I much of that. it. But that's where they would take all. They would they would loot the Bahamas and mm -hmm. Hispaniola and all that stuff, and then they would come to Boston. And the and the big financiers in the town would all pay for these boats, and they would finance it, and they'd get thirty or forty percent back of everything that would steal and loot. And wow! Rob. And that was all the money. And that the people would get mad because the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and them they would turn a blind eye to the pirates. Blackbeard and stuff would come to stay, stay for two or three months. Always been corruption. Yeah, always. Always. Land of liberals. Always. More corruption than ever. But that's where that's what it would come from. God. And all those little towns around Massachusetts where we go every fall, mm -hmm. every one of them, from Salem, Marblehead, all those, those were all pirate coves. Good gracious. And it was really interesting. It was, very, and it was after the Salem witch trials even. Wow. That is a really interesting. But, but You but, know what ticks me off is now that I'm out of school, I find history so much more interesting. Oh, There's absolutely. so much more out there than what I was taught in high school and college. Well, and I took four years of high history in college. Yeah, they just get up there and just, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and remember this date, remember this date, yes, remember this date. Yes. There's nothing to it. Well, when I, in 1986 is when I really began, became interested in history, and I went crazy. I mean, I still remember the lady coming to my house and a guy, and they were asking about Buffalo Hunter's grave. And I said, yeah, I can take you to one. I know where it is out on the spike box. Took him out there, and this lady gave me a book, um, uh, Border in the Buffalo, John Cook. And I read that and literally went nuts. Where's the, where's the grave at out there? Well, they've, gr they've grubbed it over uh, and broken the headstone. Uh, it is going to be north, northeast of headquarters, probably a few hundred yards. Right from the headquarters? Yep. You know, the old road that uh, that used to go uh, just north of headquarters, mm -hmm. and now it's just kind of an alley. Like toward Cedar Mountain? Right. It's just, you just crawl over the fence and walk out there, and it was in the brush. You could drive by when the brush was there, and you could see the headstone. 
and they they, grabbed it over. they, they were gra dra grab, uh, dragging that brush and drug over it and broke it. What's what kind of headstone was it? Just it was a seal? sandstone and had Seal Swinney shot himself accidentally January 1878. I'll be there. What's, shot what's the um, story on the um, dugout that's on the the pink house field at Jake's? I don't know. There's a, there's an old dugout in there. I do not know an old, that. An old one. No. Tony, isn't that in the pink house field? It's right across the fence, isn't it? Yeah, of course, that's pretty neat. I've been there a couple of times, and it's old, old. I mean, old dugout. Is, I mean, is it still intact? Yeah. Fireplace. You fireplace. I mean, it's not complete, not nothing like yours, but yeah, you can yeah. tell you can tell that's what it is. Yeah. Hmm. Let's go down that pink house field for a ways and try it on the north side of the fence there. I'd, I'd like to see that sometime. Tony can take you right to it. I know he knows exactly where it's okay. at. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'd love to see that. Huh. Yeah. It'd be interesting to uh, to have a metal detector and see see if you could pick up some uh, cartridges, and that would date it. My brother uh, has recently found an old campsite that we've walked over 10,000 times in our life because it's only 600 yards from where I used to live when I grew up on the Lee yeah. uh, out there at, uh, at the Herd Place. And all it is is an indention in the ground. That's it. And that's it. But he started looking around, and, man, he was finding Colt 45, 4440s, all kinds of cartridges, and somebody who hunted and shot a lot live there and that and you can date it by that i never thought about that yeah, yeah. tony can take you right to yeah. that place yeah so, and, but it was after 1878 because all of the cartridges have like uh winchester center fire wcf 4440 before 1878 all it was was a primer with no markings where, where did winchester come from in the first place i don't know that's an old 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 name yeah it is and yeah, colt's the same way yeah so Samuel Cole, yeah. would they were they shooting? Were they doing like target practice, or they were bringing no. the ammunition yeah. back? Nobody to, shot for target practice. They were bringing then. it back to reload. Now, there's another one. No, they didn't really reload the the pistol stuff. Uh -huh. They just reloaded the the, the old buffalo cartridges, uh -huh. the four, 50, 90, 45, 110, the forty four ninety, and the forty ninety. Those are the ones they really reloaded. Uh, a lot of them used fifty seventies. Uh, they didn't really reload those because you could pick them up at any military post because all military guys shot 50 70s you know spencers and such but um but the reloaders the real professionals would would uh, leave uh say rath city with you know a thousand pounds of lead and uh three or four kegs of powder you know maybe a hundred pounds of powder and um and i've got a i've got a, a keg a five pound i believe it's a five pound keg that that was given to me that was found out west of Benjamin and it's got something powder on it 1858 or 59 and it's a you can tell it's five pound powder keg can and it's it's an old black and it's got lead and where they punched a hole in it and they pour the powder out where did they where did they make powder at back then uh back east somewhere because the Winchester house is in San Francisco the mansion yeah. and that was yeah. From the lady, I just I've never thought about that, but I wonder where yeah. all these companies come from. Like Ithaca Firearms well, like, is from Ithaca, New York. Well, Dupont, that's all at Northeast mm -hmm. Company. That's uh, that's going to be in what Dupont is, uh, Maryland, is it? Yeah, that's also one of the big financiers and some of the pirate ships was a Dupont. Really? Yeah, they got their money from <laughs> it says doing things. It says they came from England, often faced with persecution and starvation in England. But the, it says the Winchester family bounced around, so they were. They're probably like early er, Scotland, and then they moved to Ireland and then to the United and States. And they got wealthy probably on war contracts, if I'm mm -hmm. guessing, because that's More where likely. most other people yeah. did get wealthy at. Yeah. War's big business. Oh, absolutely. oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, it is. What do you think, Lyndon Johnson? Yeah. Kept kept the egg in Vietnam War cooking. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to change the subject now. John okay. F. Kennedy. Yeah. Uh oh CIA assassinated him, you think? I have no idea. See, I've been reading a little bit on that, too. I damn sure read a lot, I guess. <laughs> and the, um, the Cuban mafia mm -hmm. hated Kennedy because he well, backed imagine. out him on the Bay of Pigs. Yeah. And But the more I read about John F. Kennedy, the more I like John F. Kennedy. Mm -hmm. I think oh, John F. Kennedy and Donald Trump are a lot alike. I do, too. They both spoke out against establishment, yeah. even though John F. Kennedy was from a land of, or from a family of. His Buckley. daddy got rich boot, uh, bootleg, bootlegging, bootlegging yep. Scotch. Yep. Scotch. 
Yeah, he was a bootlegger. Scotch. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Got a dollar off every bottle that come to the United States or whatever it was. Wow. And his dad wanted to be president, but he couldn't because he was a felon, I think. <laughs> Joe Kennedy. But he was the ambassador to England, I believe, in yes. World War II. Yes. But uh, John F. Kennedy didn't want to go to Vietnam. Mm-hmm. And he also wanted to kill the central bank. Is that right? Is that what that is? He wanted to get rid of... Uh, the monetary something or nothing? No. He wanted to get rid of the CIA, I know. Mm-hmm. That was one to, thing. He, he wanted to get rid of CIA, get rid of CIA, but I think he also wanted to get rid of the National Monetary Fund. One of those banking deals, mm-hmm. and well, he had enough. He had enough uh, uh, going for him as far as trying to uh, uh, diminish their capacity. There could be reason for. Oh yeah, he, he wanted to get rid of the Fed, the Federal Reserve. Oh that's what it was. man, and that's you know, and that's why they took him out. The um, I read a. One of the books I was reading about him was talks about his life as a kid growing up. You know, he grew up on, in um, Hannesport, Massachusetts, mm-hmm. and we went to his house. Me and Michelle did, mm-hmm. and it's a it's a, it's a nice house, mm-hmm. but by nineteen ten standards, it's an amazing house. Yeah, on a little yeah. like a kind of like a peninsula, like the Bush yeah. family place mm-hmm. is there, and he talks about swimming in the ocean and then they had a private pool and stuff mm-hmm. how many people had private pools during the depression yeah right and, and i mean that's the kind of life he grew up with yeah. and stuff uh-huh. and it's just amazing the kind of wealth that was accumulated by families during the depression mm-hmm. you know we've never lived in nothing like a depression where people no. are standing on a corner trying to sell apples to make something for their family right. to eat. yeah and people like him are living in this this gilded age wealth yep. and that it's just crazy you said yeah. your dad was born what 1918. 1918? Mm-hmm. Does he ever talk did he ever tell you about the depression and what he had Oh done? yes, my goodness gracious. They were poor as church mice. Really? Yeah, you know, uh, and water gravy, you know, and mush mm-hmm. uh, for two th- three two or three meals a day. I mean, they, they, he said we nearly starved to death. Oatmeal hamburgers. Yeah. Oh, and they, they made hamburger that's meat awful. out of oatmeal. Oh, God, really? that's horrible. Yep, that's it. But they made hamburger yeah. meat out of oatmeal. Well, they had to. They had to actually. Uh, I think what did he have? Seven around seven kids in the family, and they had to piecemeal them out because they was they they couldn't they couldn't feed them all. Was old Lou Holtz, the football coach, said, he said, we always had enough e- to eat growing up. And he said, yeah. I know, because my dad told me, you've had enough. <laughs> you've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I always knew we had enough to eat. But uh, see, that the, the Great Depression was in 1929. Right? <clears throat> so somebody would have to be 94 years old or older to even be born in that generation. So we've got, there's no one left that really knows right. much about it. You're going to find very many people over 100. Yeah. My grandpa could tell me about the Depression, but he was a little kid when it was going on. But yeah. it wasn't just 1929. The, the Depression lasted through the whole 30s. Yeah. yeah. Until World War started in December of 1941, which America got involved December 7th, 1941. We would yeah. have been kind yeah. of an, But the same day that we declared war on J- Japan, Germany declared war on us. Yeah. So yeah. that put us in the war. So basically anybody that was born in the late 1920s would have lived their, their childhood and adolescent lifetime yeah. through the Great Depression. Yeah. It, nope. yeah. It's sad to think, but if you want to talk about a lot of toughening up a lot of individuals, maybe that's what it's going to take. I'm telling you, and we would lose a lot of people. We would lose a, a lot of people. young people. These people oh, that they yeah. have no idea. Um, a lot of young people. But what's <clears throat> it goes back to not studying history. That's We're right. too dumb that's right. to look at what we've hey, gone through. Uh, let, me, let me tell you something. Uh, yesterday I, was, I stopped by a store there in Benjamin. A little gal wa- waited on me. And there was an Ernest Tubb song playing. And I said, you know who that is? Uh, no. <laughs> I said, that's Ernest Tubb. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I said, did you know what? He lived here one time <coughs> for about seven years. I didn't know that. And the other two little ladies over there, they had no idea. I said, no yeah. Clue. I said, they, they lived out here west of Benjamin, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and uh, he had a sister, and she was thrown in my jail up there. <laughs> and they could not. I mean, he was like. And then when I left, I got the feeling it was like no big deal to him. No. Who gives a shit? As a country western singer that lived in Benjamin, Texas. That's what it felt like. If it makes you feel any better, they probably don't know who um, Elvis Presley is or Liberace. <laughs> yeah. so, I mean, What did she get thrown in jail for? Running whiskey. Oh, you running? were you. You went to get wine. Oh, uh, we I went to go get wine. This. I'm yeah. sorry. I was yeah. a, I was a yeah. wine runner. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You so were y'all were telling me all the good yeah. stuff. She so was, she got thrown in jail for bootlegging. Bootlegging. Um, I'm, the book I have, the old jail book, has her in there. I know twice before the center <clears> of the penitentiary, and then Ooh. yeah, for one year, and 
she, okay, the story goes that she came back uh, singing in the jailhouse now, and that's what got Ernest Tubbs singing in the jailhouse now. Yeah. How, singing in the jailhouse. When did the jail close down? 1948, I believe. Okay, well, I was going to say Danny Mac might be in there for fighting. Never <laughs> been after 1948. Yeah, but, uh, it's amazing the number of people. I mean, I can look through. I mean, it's just pages and pages. The only only bad thing about it is from 1900 to 1910, there's missing. No. Everybody, the, the, it's all gone. I don't know where it is. It's somebody must somewhere. have had somebody in there they didn't want it to be seen. Apparently, but but I mean, if there's ten year period there there are no entries in that book. And that's sad. I'd love to find that book somewhere. I mean, it's those little big, big uh, log books. It's, you know, like, what, 18 inches tall. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the, the writing in the 1900s is just glorious writing. Yes. The really true, mm -hmm. that, that, that whatever style. Yeah. yeah. And then, then you get into and then the 20s, and you're just like, what are they, what are they, write, what are they writing here? Oh, yeah, that, that's, that's that Tubbs woman there, you know. People and today can't even write though. No, kids no. today don't know how to write in cursive. No. You know, you know, I can. I don't write, even think they teach that anymore. I write my name, but in college, I always printed. Mm -hmm. I printed all my notes. Well, I did too. Now that I think about it, I'm a horrible. I have a doctor's writing. It's horrible. My scribble at the bank is just. That's all yeah, it is. And yeah. the ladies up there know. When I first started banking here, they would call me, and then it would be like, one time, one of the ladies at the window said, "Oh my gosh." You wrote a check to somebody the other day, and they called here to verify that that was really a signature. I was like, yeah, that's Jeff's signature. But kids today do not know how to write. Yeah. You know, they don't know how to write. I mean, we used to sit and write A and B, oh, and, and, the, and the classroom would have the A's, the the cat, the printed A, and then the cursive yeah. A, and then the small A, and they'd have all these kids today have no idea. You but they, they everything's on print is a keyboard. Oh, it's on keyboard. Everything. You take my notes that I wrote back when I was doing research at Tech, and I had some beautiful writing. Now, those notes mm -hmm. I would write. Right. And I wrote with a rapidograph pen, so it would be forever. Mm -hmm. And uh, and, I, and I can open that book and go, whoa, man, I used to really write. I mean, this is quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, But now I'll just write my name, but everything else I'll print. My dad had great penmanship. I mean, he spelled his name and everything was just... To, yeah. and even when I was a kid, I'd always be amazed at that. But that's the way he was raised. Yeah, that was yeah. the way everyone was at that. Was time. it a sign of intelligence? I wonder back back in the days, they would look at the penmanship. I don't, I don't know, but Dad just had a really Ronald F. Stanfield. But it was yeah. it was really it like was pretty obvious. A, yeah. yeah, like English type. I mean, yep. but that, but that's why he signed his name and stuff. Yep. And I wish I had one of that. I'd get. But it, but that's the way he was he was raised. That's yep. where they were taught. I'm terrible at English and grammar because. I took a, I had a black lady that taught English to me mm -hmm. at Wichita Falls High School, and she was a funny lady. Her name was Dorothy Wilson, and I took her every year I was in high school because she was funny. Yeah, she didn't teach <laughs> me nothing, but she called the kids "ug mug" and "slug," and she made fun of kids. And I found it was funny, so I would take her class because she cracked me up. Mm -hmm. Worst thing I ever did. And then a friend of mine that's an architect. I said something about on Facebook one time. He goes, did you have Miss Wilson for English? I said, oh, yeah, for four years. He was older than me three years. He goes, well, I did, too. He said, I've regretted that ever since. <laughs> so I took college English three times. Yeah. It's so horrible. And I still, it's it's there, 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 yeah. where, where, where. I, it's all. Yeah. It's just because I didn't never learn. You know what's, what's crazy is I've written, you know, two books, photographed 25 others, and I've written the book where we're fixing to publish, 20,000 words. I've got on it now, I think, 22,000. And, and I can write. I've written dozens of magazine articles. And the first one I ever wrote was in 1981, David Baxter at Parks and Wildlife. And he said, uh, I want you to write me an article on coyotes. I went, well, David, I've never written before. And he said, give it a shot. He said, I think you can do it. And I wrote this article. I, of course, back then, I hand, you know, hand wrote the damn thing you know, on, a, on a yellow pad. And then I typed it up on the typewriter and sent it to him. And he got it, and he said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, this is better than probably 90% of the writers that I have. Wow. And yet, I cannot tell you how to, uh, what do they call it, whenever you take a sentence and you break it down with all yeah, this. Yeah, the, the, the grammar, uh, not the grammar. I know uh, what you're talking about. but Punctuation. I no, no, you break it down into lines. Yes. I, to where they, you got they never taught adjectives you and stuff like that. I couldn't do that. Was it graphing? I believe it was. Might have been uh, grabbing a graphing or something. Yeah, yeah. But, I think that's what it's called. But uh, but English, uh, the fir my first and second English in college, um, 
I mean, I really struggled on, especially the first one because I mean, it was like I, I wrote my first paper. I mean, you know, the first thing they do is I'll go write an autobiography. Man, I made me a big fat D. <laughs> I thought I was really cutting the fat hole, Gary Boy, and I got her back. And I, a D? I can't even write an autobiography. <laughs> I remember the guy name was, was uh, Mr. Lightfoot, and uh, and then uh, then one day he came in and he said, "Okay." I want to give you three, give this class three subjects to write on. And one of them was a Vietnam War, and the other one was I forgot what, and but the third one was an enjoyment of hunting. There you go. I and got somehow, that. somehow, I think he did that for me. Because I, I, he picked up on something. Mm -hmm. And I wrote that paper, went back to, the, uh, to the, my dorm room, wrote that paper, handed it in. He hated uh, incomplete sentences. Oh, he hated them. You got 10 points off for every one of them. Oh, I would be negative 40 on my paper then. And he got up that net when they, uh, like this was on a Monday and on Wednesday, he got up in front of the class. He said, okay. He said, I don't think that Wyman Windsor here in class would mind my saying he wrote one of the best papers I've ever read from a freshman. Wow. But he had four, four incomplete, incomplete sentences. sentences, so I got a big fat D. Mm. But when he said that what he did about the way I wrote that article, that inspired me so much mm. that I passed that day come class with a C. <laughs> so, you, so, you, so you learned something from a negative. Oh, oh ain't that crazy I how mean, that works? I mean, he, he it made me want to do something. Yes. Up until that point, it was like, God, will I ever, you know. Mm -hmm. I'll never pass could, this class. Can you imagine a high school fre or a college freshman today and getting called out in front of the class for that? Yeah. Oh, they go to the room and kill themselves. <laughs> I mean, shit, that's the kind of crap that happens yeah. today. Kids ain't got no bottom yeah. to them no more. But but that, and I remember I saw him late. And, I mean, he, he, he wasn't trying to show favoritism or anything. I saw him after I finished his class one day in the library in the in the uh, elevator, and I said, you know, I was, I was my second semester, and I was a big shot, you know. Ah, oh, hey, Mr. Lightfoot, uh, how's those freshmen doing? <laughs> he looked over at me, kind of with a kind of a smart smirk, and he said, I'll "About like you did." <laughs> <laughs> and I just looked straight ahead, and with the door open, I walked out. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew he wasn't trying to, <laughs> trying to make me feel great or anything. But those words of inspiration, yeah, yeah. that made a difference. And of course, my second semester was uh, English Lit, which that was horrible. Mm -hmm. But I almost made a B. <laughs> I think I had a 78 average. But my third was technical writing, and I could do that. Yeah. And that's what got me really started into writing. Well, it's crazy how just one positive, one little, one, one little spark can be all that it takes. That's it. For when somebody. I when I taught at Tech, uh, I got I saw a lot of sorry pictures. Yeah. But whenever, and like, like my, my uh, approach to a class was everybody would bring in their images that they'd shot during the week. And I, I'd say, okay, pick your three best, and we're going to pop them up on the board, and I'm going to criticize them. And, I mean, I'd pop some up there, and I would just, my jaw would drop, and I'd go, Jesus Christ, <laughs> to myself, how can I say anything good about this? Right. But I knew it was important. Everything might be horrible except for one thing, and I would focus on that one thing mm -hmm. to make that person feel like they could keep going. Right. I wanted to say, this sucks. <laughs> and back of my mind was, this, this picture is awful. But I'd say, okay, you know what? Your composition here is real good. Mm -hmm. Why don't you work a little bit maybe on your, on your exposure and uh, and something else, but but your and your focus, but your composition is really good, and it would make them feel good. Right. And by gosh, the next time they come in, they're done we'll better. Be better. But I could have gone up there like some teachers I've had up there, chew you out, tell you how sorry you were, mm -hmm. you know. But I wasn't going to do that. Well, and something like writing or something like sharing a, a a picture, it takes courage because that's a part of them. 
It takes sure. courage to be like, okay, this is what I've got right now. Sure, this is the way I felt. This is my emotion that made me create this image. Right. And when you cut it to pieces yeah. and make them feel like they're an inch tall, you're not doing anybody any good. Mm -hmm. Except yes. make me you yourself feel like a big shot. Right. Photography's yeah. a class two people take because they have a passion for it. That's not yeah. something they want to drop, I wouldn't think. Sure. Either. Like like some classes you take in school and you're like, Yeah, I just drop it. Yeah. Photography's not, a few not of them. A, yeah, me too. Photography's not a class you drop though. Yeah. I had some uh, that would just quit and just, they wouldn't show up anymore. And I'd give them a zero. And they would come up the next year, the next semester, and said, we're sorry, we had some issues, and we're going to do it this time, and they'd make an A. Mm -hmm. And I'd tell them, I'd say, I appreciate you coming and telling me this. Let's, let's do it this time. Boom. You would have been a fun professor to teach, but you should have taught, prof you should have, you're, you're the greatest photographer I know, <laughs> but you might not know it. Many. <laughs> you should have been an. You should have been a Southwest history teacher or something like that. That uh, that would have been fun. That would have been your calling because you have yeah. a passion for that. Yep. And I'm like Andy. The older I, as I've gotten older, I really appreciate history. I liked history growing up through kids. I was yeah. mesmerized with the Indians and Thanksgiving yeah. and all that Columbus yeah. and all that yeah. stuff that. Well, was I was finding in, out to be fake. I but, was into paleontology. In archaeology, when I grew up as, as a kid, I mean, as a little kid, man, I was digging up bones constantly, and I had a bone collection. Rock geology, well, I thought, well, I mean, maybe I. I remember <laughs> going to take. I, I needed an um, uh, an extra class. I thought I'll take geology. Holy Moses! It wasn't like picking up rocks at home <laughs> when I was a kid. A hard class. But I was I was ready to get out of there. <laughs> that was that was tough. What was your <laughs> science you took? Uh, I, physiology. And that is oh. how the body, so like if you're going to move your finger like this, what, uh, what is your brain doing to your spinal cord? What messages is it sending? And then like what is actually making your finger do this? Problem is, I took anatomy and physiology as a senior in high school. Uh -huh. I got an A at it because uh -huh. it was, this is the femur, this uh -huh. is the you know, tibia, fibia. Uh -huh. That was anatomy I got. Yeah. The physiology, the breakdown of how we do this, oh, yeah. or why yeah. do I feel a mosquito biting me, yeah. about kicked my ass. The <laughs> first day, I walked in, and it was a summer class. I needed a lab science to graduate uh, on time. And I walk in the first day, and I look around me. It's 8 a.m. class. And I look around me, and everybody's wearing scrubs. Nurses. Uh, oh, no. Doctors. <laughs> Graduates. One guy's got that. like a, he's got a white coat on. I'm like, son of a bitch i am not in the right class and then he professor's got you know what class it is written up on the board and he said there's two ways you get out of the comprehensive final you're either you either have perfect attendance or you have an a average going into the uh Whoa. final Whoa. my ass was in the same seat at 8 a.m every, every single day because i knew that if i had to take that comprehensive final it was gonna sink my boat and i walked out of there with a c plus yeah, and glad to get it. And glad to get it. There Absolutely. was a quiz every day. There was a test every week. And it so must, being a doctor been, was not that, in your that, that had to been a pre med. That had to be a pre med. Yeah, I don't. I don't know yeah. what it was, but I looked around and everybody was wearing nursing gear and white coats, and I thought, I have, I have royally. I could have taken <laughs> astrology, <laughs> yeah. and, and just you know coasted. But I was yeah. like, in my mind, when I signed up for the class, it was physiology, and I was like. Yeah. I took anatomy and physiology at Knox yeah. City. This will be a cakewalk. I got yeah. an A in it. A little different <laughs> class, huh? <laughs> I did. And then, like, the detailed notes. I mean, I've, I think I've still got that notebook. I'd like to yeah. find it. Who I was mean, your A and P teacher at Knox City? Coach Hutch. Wayne, he's a smart guy, but. I mean, but it was, it was, here's a picture of a skeleton, and then you, like, you color code the, the skeleton. It was not near as, as in-depth as the second <laughs> smartest, what I got. The second smartest person in Knox County teaches at school up here right now. And that's Kent DeVille. Do you know Kent? No, I don't. He's a very sharp man. Yeah, he is. Very, very. I think he's got like a bionuclear chemistry really? disease or, some, or d a degree yeah. from. Wow. He ran. He ran. He was a high jumper at Tech, wasn't he? I think so. On full ride. Did he's our really? Is he a chemistry teacher here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a science teacher. He's. Uh, He'd he, have to be a real good teacher to get me through chemistry. I'll tell you he, that. He's <laughs> a sharp, sharp, sharp man. Real yeah. sharp guy. Makes his own arrows and everything. He's an interesting guy. Oh, I've yeah. recently. I've started. Uh, looking at the bible and the how it was composed and mm -hmm. the the different uh the different uh councils that they got before they got the canon like we see today i mean mm -hmm. it's fascinating stuff i bet i, I mean so. now you know it, it 
there's some things that you see and you're like, mm, I'm not sure how. Because we're studying Revelations in, in. Oh, that's kind of depressing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But actually, so one of the things that I've, I've read, because we started studying Revelations, so I started researching Revelations. And it was, it's wartime literature. Uh-huh. That's all it is. So oh, what man. it was, so John of Patmos, the guy that writes it, he was exiled on an island. And if you read other verses in the Bible, Jesus said that Jerusalem's going to fall, and that's going to be the start of the second coming. Uh-huh. And Jesus says in Luke 21 that when Jerusalem falls, I, God will come back within one generation. Well, John sees Jerusalem fall, and he goes, he goes to be an old man, and he's like, wait a second, my generation's about to pass, and nothing's happening. But the, the world's foremost scholar on Revelation says it's just wartime literature is all it is. Same as Churchill talking during World War II. Wow. He's just riling up the Christians. But, I, I mean, it's just, there's so much more. If you just scratch just a little bit on any topic that you're interested in, there's uh-huh. just a world of... Oh. Under the surface, yeah. Under the surface of anything. Yeah. Of just oh, sure. the history that's out here. Sure. And all you gotta do is scratch a little you bit. You just gotta gotta dig. Yep. But but people we do such a we do such a terrible job of teaching our kids in high school mm-hmm. and college that just there's so much more than you could ever imagine. And it's yep. so much more interesting than you could ever imagine. Yeah. And they don't they don't they don't try to make it interesting. At least whenever I took history and government Dates, in, in college, names. it was it was dreary. It's dates and names. It all yeah, is all that it, it is. That's it. But I mean, you know, you look at the Vikings and and the things, that, and I know that their history is kind of sparse and and tough to read. But Jesus, I mean, just the the places that they went and the mm-hmm. their yeah. battles and they were tough cookies. The Indians. I mean, you could spend you could you could start studying today and not know everything that there is to know on on the Native Americans. Right. I mean, it's, it's just it's fascinating stuff, and it's we so do our good. kids such a disservice. Uh, in the way that we teach them. When, uh, when's your new book coming out? Uh, we need to have all of our, um, the text and the design to the printer by probably mid-May. Mm-hmm. And it should be in by October. Good. And uh, it's looking really good. We got to Mark Mahorsky as our designer. He used to design Parks and Wildlife Magazine. He now designs uh, Texas Highways. Uh, great guy, conservative guy, and uh, really talented. And uh, he showed me the cover the other day, and oh man, I mean, it's it's absolutely breathtaking. I love it. Really? Have yes. you enjoyed it? Have you enjoyed this process? I have. It's it's a process I've needed to do. I started this book in 1969, and I still have the first eight or ten pages, handwritten pages. And then whenever I realized that I didn't have enough experience, mm-hmm. I needed to. So. Fifty years later, finally I finally fin- I finally finished the book. Yeah, and um, and it's pretty comprehensive. It's got a lot of anecdotal uh, stories in it, uh, but it covers all aspects of uh, of calling. It doesn't have to, It doesn't deal in killing. Uh, only thing that you can really say, yeah, he had to kill something was I give a lot of stuff on the on the the weight, like a chart weight chart on uh, the coyotes are getting bigger, mm-hmm. getting heavier. And I think that's uh, probably a, a process. Today, they, to, today, today way, uh, as opposed to 1972, 1973, when I finished my research, male coyotes averaged uh, 24 pounds, plus or minus a few ounces. Today, like this year, they averaged 30.1 pounds. Damn, that's a big increase. Yeah. But that's, I think it's because of so many wild hogs killed. Oh. And there's just such a so so much protein out pro, so protein 20% out there. So twenty percent increase in body weight. Yeah. And now that's that's from that's this year. Now it's slower than that. It's, it's you know this year it really ticked Spiked. up. Would it go from two years ago? Oh, I don't know. I'd have to look. Uh, I just figured it up, and I've got it written down at home. Uh, because one of the other editors is coming next week, to uh, so we can establish what type of charts we need to use. Mm-hmm. But uh, but it's going to be real real interesting. It's going to have information in it that has never ever been published before. So do the coyotes? Do they look? Because a pig's a big animal. Do they mm-hmm. look for the lame, sick one? And that's what they no. They they, they they'll uh, they'll they'll eat the ones that's been shot. 
that oh, all the hunters shoot, uh -huh. like well, the chopper guys, the like like Pate and his hunting bunch. Yeah. You know, they killed ninety nine two two weekends ago. Wow, and that's a lot of meat. Yeah, and you put that with the say a one percent death loss of yearlings out in these wheat fields, and the coyotes getting bigger. Cause see, we haven't had a, um, a cedar cre a cedar berry crop in two years, no cedar berries to speak of. Uh, this summer we had no mesquite beans. None. So the so basically this and no and hardly any cactus apples, and those are three big deals for coyotes really? through the summer. Absolutely. Mesquite beans. Mesquite beans. Mesquite and beans. Cedar really berries. big. Mesquite beans followed by cactus apples and cedar berries. Those are three biggies, and we've and we've lost them all. I don't even know what, what cedar berry is. It's red berry. On red it. berry on these cedar trees. Yeah. I never even thought those are edible. Oh, good. That's all coyotes eat from uh, about October to uh, January. Are they? There's poisonous for humans, aren't they? No, they just bitter. Okay. Just bitter. You're thinking of. But no, I'm thinking of cedar berries, and I always they, heard they that might, they were just. They're so, so bitter, you think they're poison. <laughs> but the apples <laughs> off of the but off the cactus. See, I'll tell you what oh. happened to us. Like at the lodge right here, mm -hmm. we had these huge cactus. I'm gonna tell you what. Every Mexican in Knox City come over here and cut them because they would yeah. they eat them. Yeah, those the, are, these are these are those spineless cactus. Right? Yes, they, yeah, and they loved them, man. I'm telling, I had two make, families come out here to they make, make really big apples. Napola, Napolis, I think they want the Napolis because they eat them. The, mm -hmm. the that the freeze wiped them out. Yeah, so yeah, I'm they sure killed ours too. So it did all of them. So that's why there's no prickly pears, right? Yeah, that's that's they, they killed all of ours. Now, the the native prickly pear, the the freeze didn't really hurt them that bad. You know, you're one with your big, you know, thorns on them. Right. But as far as your spineless, like I have around my house, man, it, it knocked the devil out of them. Yeah, it looks like somebody's lit them on fire and molded them over or yeah. something. They look yeah. horrible. So the coyotes, but but all the pigs being killed, especially by the helicopters and mm -hmm. stuff, our coyotes are eating a lot better. They're eating what a lot they better. behind. Yep. Um, it has is the freeze what the catalyst is for the cedar berries and the mesquite beans not not uh, coming back? No, nope, no, I what, think what I think it's rain at the right time, moisture oh, at the right time. Because we had a wet spring last well, year. Well, and I'll tell you something else. If you have a hard rain, whenever the uh, uh, just the mesquites bud out, when that when when you've got the, you know the the, the long yes flowering uh -huh. portion, that'll knock those off. A hail or a heavy rain will knock those off, and you won't have you won't have mesquite beans. So I've always heard mesquite beans. If you got mesquite beans, going to be hard winter. That's what the old timers used to tell yeah. me. They've been wrong on that. Yeah, yeah. or they're hard winters. Well, February. In February now. Yeah. We don't have winter in November, December anymore. That's right. That's right. But uh, but the coyotes are are getting bigger, according to my notes, and that's over. Well, since uh, 1970. Actually, this book starts about 1974. That's where my notes really got heavy. Now I've got I've got my notes from my research, but I just used I just used a summation there mm -hmm. of those, which were average twenty four pounds uh, for males, twenty two pounds for females. Now the females weigh around twenty four, and the the males are going to go around twenty eight on the average. So they 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 are getting bigger. And they bigger. are getting bigger. What's wow. the biggest bobcat you've weighed? Uh, twenty eight pounds. When that guy tell us the other day that bobcat weighed? I don't remember. Is it fifty? Have pounds? you noticed our our bobcats huge. also following this trend of of gaining body I, mass? I don't I don't I don't trap bobcats anymore so you so don't, don't have know. enough literature to, uh, to find out mm -hmm. it would be uh well the wild wild pigs not going anywhere and no no and neither no, no. is the no. helicopter hunting from what we can tell right so right and pates pates booked up uh every weekend from first of january to the first of june he's totally booked up every month every weekend with hog hunters does he get nervous I would, I would be, uh, uh, not really. I mean, he handing some city slicker a, a rifle. Oh well, now he's, he's had some, he's had some run-ins. He's grabbed some old boys and throwed them on the ground, took the gun away from. Them. Yeah, you'd have to. Yeah, it's life or death up there. Yeah. We, we, uh, we've got the the, the pigs aren't going to go anywhere. I don't know about the helicopter hunting. I don't have a problem with it at all. My problem, or not a problem at all. My question is, is how long are the liberals? Something's going to happen one that's day, it. and the liberals are going to get a hold of that's this. That's it. That, that's what I'm. That's what I've been. And that's I'm surprised it's went this long. This long. I guarantee you, all the, you know, if you do it quietly, and it's no big deal. But when you put it on Facebook, when you put it on social media and boast about it and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Guarantee it's going to come back to haunt you. It's, it's, it's all problems. over the place. Everywhere it's you look, come, it's going to come back to haunt you. The swamps in Louisiana, places you've seen it all over the place. But I just, I'm, I'm really supply, surprised, especially with the liberal people we have in deal, that someone hasn't come out and said, hey, 
the FAA, you need to look into this. I'm really surprised oh, yeah. it's gone. But but I can tell you this much: even out here, I don't notice a big difference in our hog population. Oh no, there's they, they and as many as they're shooting. Them. I can't imagine if they weren't shooting them, how yeah. many we'd have. That's there's, the scary part. Now, Pete told me he said there's there's just there's plenty of hog. In fact, he has to he has to pull back. See, the deal on, on it is uh, at, especially at the end of the season, you need to not try to kill every blasted pig that you see at mm -hmm. the beginning. I mean, it's great to say, yeah, my bunch killed 150 hogs. Well, come the last of April and through May, you don't have any. And so Pay tries to keep it down a little bit, not not let them get, you know, get Once too Once the trees get up, it's harder, too. On yeah, them. and so he's got a consistent, you know, huntable population throughout. And that's just, that's just kind of conserving, you know, conservation in a way. And uh, but uh, but a lot of these guys, you know, with, with choppers, they'll see how many they can kill, so they can boast about it, and that's not a good thing. I tell you what would be fun, someone to fix up an old P fifty one Mustang or old Corsair. <laughs> oh yeah, and, and and shoot them suckers on them big open wheat fields. <laughs> Would that, that not be yeah, fun? Yeah, coming in at 400 miles that an be hour, a blast? it'd be a real short burst, I'll tell you. <laughs> have you ever got to fly in a Corsair or P-51? I haven't. Boy, that was always a dream of mine, but I never have. Man, when I was a when I was a little kid, we went to see the Confederate Air Force. Do you remember when they mm -hmm. had that? And it was at Harlingen, Texas. Mm -hmm. And they had Corsairs, P-51s, a P-38 and yeah. stuff. And mm -hmm. I thought, man, that would be so awesome to have one of those. Yeah. That's what I watch. That's the documentaries I watch whenever I don't want to go out. If the wind's blowing, it's too cold, too hot. I sit and watch the uh, the World War II Corsairs and P-47 Thunderbolts. Man, it just thrills me to death. And especially to sit there and, and watch those boys take off and fly those machines of war, destruction, and they're 20 and 22 years old. Yep. yep. And they taught yeah. them how to fly in six that months. blows. And they were boys from the Depression. Some of yep. them had never even seen a plane. Yep. Mm -hmm. And yet they're flying some of the most – some of the most lethal weapons in the world. It may be like putting a kid today that's never been at Dillon, putting them in a F-15 or something. That's right. Now, 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 it wasn't as hard to fly those planes as it is an F-15. There's no doubt about it. Well, but the no, dynamics I'll are the same. I'll, I'll tell you what, I, I disagree with that. Because no I, I've flown, I have flown uh, in the, um, um, all that, um, what do you call it? When it's, the stick shift? Well, no, it's, it's uh, at the Air Force, and they've got the. Uh, simulator? Simulator. Uh -huh. I've flown a T-38 simulator. Easy to take off, easy to fly, easy to land. But you put a man in a P-51, you know, with a 1,750-horsepower Rolls-Royce that all you got to do is give it too much too much throttle, and that son of a buck will flip you upside down, and you're in the ground on takeoff. Right, yeah. But with a jet, you just throttle that son of a buck and hold that nose up, and she goes and climbs on out. And, I mean, the only thing I did wrong is I did a loop, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I pulled up too quickly because I was used to – I was used to uh, uh, a prop plane, and I pulled up too quickly, and I killed myself, basically. The guy said, well, you just killed <laughs> you yourself. Just you killed pulled nine Gs. Wow. Well, in a prop plane, you know, the one I used to fly, I'd, I'd nose down to 150, and you'd haul back on that stick, and, yeah, your face would fall down, <laughs> and, you know, like this, and you go, oh, God. And then you'd roll over on your back and go, well, this is cool, you know, until the plane started sputtering. Because it was a, it's a carburetor instead of fuel <laughs> injecting. You go, I better straighten up. And then you roll it straight back. But with a jet, but I mean, it's uh, you know, there's so much more to a jet as far as the electronics. Right. That's what's going to make it a more complex airplane. But if somebody said, and I'd never been in either one, fly a Mustang or that jet, I believe I'd crawl in that damn jet. Now the Mustang, when you land it, you got to land it right because they, they, they. They didn't. There weren't rear draggers on wheels. Yeah, they were tailor wheels. Yeah. Right. So you had yeah. if you screwed up and you went over fast forward. A guy in Fort Worth, Charlie Hilliard, was owned. He got killed in one. He had one for play that he played in. It was uh -huh. an air show, uh -huh. and the prop hit the damn ground. Oh, okay. And it so flipped in. in, in probably the he was doing a. He was doing. Uh, maybe he bounced it, or he was doing a wheel landing and and with a tail too high because that prop is eleven feet from tip to tail. Yes, and something like that happened, but. Man, that, those those planes were awesome back then. And have you seen the uh, on Netflix? They have a new one called uh, "Men and Their Machines." It's about the airplanes. 
I've seen it. Have you seen it? I've I just now noticed it. The I love World War II and color the stories, oh, especially yeah. the ones on the missions that they go on. Me too. And Harry that works for us, his dad was it uh, in Bataan, and his oh, dad was really? under MacArthur. And his dad, I've got a book that his dad's wrote memoirs in, and I've got it at the house. I need to read it. Yeah. I haven't got to do it. But his dad's on a YouTube documentary, and they show him, talk about everything during World War II. And it was, was he on the is, Death March? Yes, and this is like 15 years later. Oh, my goodness. I'll tell you a hell of a story. Is Joe Bob Tyler. He was me and Tony's football coach at Wichita mm-hmm. Falls High School. He was at uh, in a German prison camp, and he he went on a big. They they walked him to death basically. What they mm-hmm. did, and he was a healthy man. He weighed two hundred and twenty five pounds when he was sixty five years old. I've seen I've seen work out with two hundred and forty five pounds on a machine. With, I mean on free weights and work mm-hmm. out. A great, great, great man, probably one of the greatest men. And he was there, and he carried his roommate. And he got down to one hundred and thirty pounds and carried mm-hmm. his, his his guy with him, and they ate a raw chicken. And um, because they didn't want the Germans to know they had, they ate a raw chicken. They ate the damn uh, thing. That's I mean, bad. That, and that's all they had. And they were happy to have it. But uh, I remember one time at football practice, a kid on the team said, Coach, I'm thirsty. Oh, no. no. <laughs> so we sat <laughs> and we talked. <laughs> that man knew about being thirsty or hungry. Mm-hmm. You know, you weren't thirsty or hungry. On a life or, or death scale. Yeah. But, but he yeah. would do anything for a player, but he would look you in your face. But he couldn't coach today because he would grab you by your face oh, yeah. mask to chew on your ass. Oh, sure. And if you screw, if you didn't screw up, but you were next to him and someone else screwed up, he would grab your face mask <laughs> while he's chewing on someone else's ass. <laughs> hey, 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 man. But, <laughs> but, but he coached, you know, back when the Coyotes were state championship type teams mm-hmm. every year, and he'd have a – if you jumped off sides, he'd swatch on your ass with a board and stuff. Yeah. And we need more men like that in life. But oh, that's absolutely. Kind of so what was that march? They were taking them from one place to they, the They were trying to, the to – they were trying to kill a bunch of them, and they would go and from Bulgaria to wherever. I mean, I don't yeah. remember the whole. I can't so remember you were, exactly. You were just there to. You were just walking. That's from one yeah. place no to aim another. In sight. No, they didn't. Well, my uh, my flight instructor was a B twenty four pilot in World War Two, and he was shot down in a POW camp for three years, and he weighed ninety pounds when they. When same they same type deal. It's just terrible. He said they marched them through the snow up to their knees, into Berlin, uh, as the as the Axis power. I mean, as the the uh, uh, Allied powers were closing in, and he said. They walked us between people. Joseph Goebbels was up on a podium pointing at him, said, these are the men who bombed your women and children in, 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 the, in Germany and killing them, innocent people. And said they, hey, they beat on us and hit us with rocks and everything. And he said, I weighed 90 pounds when they liberated me. Yeah, it was, it was a horrible, horrible world. And that's what's wrong. This sounds horrible, but that's why our country is where it is now. There's no men like that left. That's right. You know, everybody today outside of the Vietnam era, and there, there's some guys have been to the desert in Iraq and Iran and stuff, have been through some bad things, you bet. but it's a very small portion of our population. Right. Back in 1955, if you talk to a, a, an adult male that was in his mid-30s, early mm-hmm. 40s, nine out of ten of them had been in the service or, yep. or fought doing something. That's right. My grandmother was Rosie the Riveter. She built a B-24s or whatever it was in Wichita, Kansas, whatever that uh, made there. Are. At the Boeing and Cessna yeah. factory. That's yeah. what she did during World War II. Yeah. Her husband was at, you know, my grandpa was at Pearl Harbor, and she yeah. was in Wichita, Kansas, yeah. building planes. Everybody stuck together. That's right. This is what I just, um, There's a place, there was a place in Japan called Unit 731, and it was where they, uh, it was during World War II. It was where they would take people and they would perform experiments on them. Bio, weapon, they would figure out, you know, what to do. But mm. they, it says here they would perform horrific experiments without anesthesia. They would put people's, uh, they were trying to figure out frostbite. So they'd plunge your arms into the water or into the ice and then they'd wait and see. And then they'd break your arms to see if you'd feel it. But it's just terrible, the things that, that they, but it's called Unit 731. If you really want to get a deep dive on how uh, just how cruel, the unimaginable, just the unimaginable cruelty of World War Two. Oh yeah, and that's in Japan. So I mean, you just thought that the Germans were yeah Japanese. Were, well, they didn't think we were even humans. Right, right. You know, at least the, at least the Nazis considered us a, a worthy adversary. And the Japanese thought we were just inhuma, inhuman. We, we were just animals. Except for Tojo, wherever the head guy was. He, yeah. knew, he knew he done fucked up. <laughs> Maybe that's why they got the atomic bomb and not and not Germany. I'll Maybe you, that's why we reserved that for them. Two funny stories. First one is the story of when he tells the people after Pearl Harbor, uh-huh. he said, I'm afraid we've woken a sleeping giant. Yeah. He called I, that one right. I think that was Yamamoto. Uh, the, yeah, it was. Yamamoto. And then the guy that goes to, to France 
and goes to the airport a couple years ago, and the guy goes, I need your passport. He goes, I don't have a passport. I got my driver's license. He goes, if you come to France, you have to have a passport. He goes, last time I was here, I didn't need a France. I need, need a a passport. passport. He said, anytime you come to France, there's a Frenchman that's going to be expecting you to passport. He said, well, last time I was here at Normandy, you couldn't see a fucking Frenchman anywhere inside. <laughs> I love it. And that's a damn truth. I love it. I love it. <laughs> well, we've spent two and a half hours on here, Wyoming. Yep. It well, was a great, great conversation. Well, just, I'd just, just like to plug my book. It, uh, Like I say, it should be out by next October. And um, it's going to be The Art of Predator Calling. And um, it is um, uh, tradition in, in uh I see it's, I see, what is it? The Art of Predator Calling, A Portrait in Tradition. And uh, it's just how to do it. And the enjoyment of being out in the field, you can apply it for hunting, you can apply it for photography, you can apply it for research, but however, this is how it's done in a traditional fashion. There are no electronic flip switches to flip on a Fox Pro or something, which are good. Mm -hmm. But I have pictures of my own calls, and um, and it's it's the way that we've done it traditionally. How I learned from the old men from the 40s and 50s. It's the Wyman Menzer way. It's my Wyman Menzer way. We, we, Do you uh, envision there being another book after this, or no. is this this is it? I think this is my last. This book. is your I'm, last I'm one. I'm tired. This is about 29 books, 28 or 29 books. I'm tired. It's, it, this and is this it. Is coming out in but October. It, but it's October, been a long yeah. time in the making. So. It's been a long time in the making. It's been uh, 57 years of experience. We're going to have you come out before it back comes out again and plug it again. Okay. Right before Sam, it comes I out. I appreciate that. Because we appreciate having you on here. It's you been bet. an absolute pleasure as always. Thanks for Mr. having Mr. me, Menzer, guys. And uh, let's get out of here before the snow hits. Okay. Thank Sounds you very good. much. God bless y'all and have a great week. Thank you. I got some wine in here. You can keep that. Take oh, that home with I'll, you. I'll just, no, I didn't take the whole thing home with me. You can cup here. You and Celinda can have a fun night. Go check out all of our sponsors. Check out Dive Bomb Industries, Boss Shot Shells, Pacific Calls, Shin Gear Waiters, Dirty Duck Coffee, Lucky Duck, Alpha Outdoors, Looking Glass Duck Club Podcast, Gundog Outdoors, Take Plains Meats, Sample Hunt Outfitters.